black licorice apparently is something better? that you can yeah you can like why do people to. think black licorice is australian i don't even know i've never in my life thought it was australian but every time you see black licorice mm -hmm. like that one is that all this it says it will says wallaby on it willy wallaby are we on is are we live? Right now? Yeah, we're live all right so, <laughs> hey um so those of you who are at home probably have seen my interview with father jason neil i don't know if you know this or not but father jason was you know father jason mm -hmm. Or Father Chad, as we call him, yep. he went to Ukraine. Do you know this? I didn't. Like know. he's in Ukraine right now. Oh gosh! Right. He went literally. This is how cool he is to save twenty-one orphans. He's somehow That's associated amazing. with yeah. an orphanage in Ukraine. So he texted me the other day. He's like, "Pray for me. Get everyone to pray for me. We're going to Ukraine with the only two people flying in there right now." I'm like, "All right." So my wife and I have been praying for him constantly. I want to share a text message exchange that took place at like midnight last night. Um. Is this weird that you're like, I'm not even talking to you? No, I'm into no. it. I want to <laughs> okay. read the text message. Okay. I tried to read it earlier, but your phone was made in. The yeah, it's impossible then, yeah. to use. I said this, uh, my wife has been praying multiple rosaries for you in the middle of the night. I have also been praying. He writes back, uh, get all people you can to pray. So this is kind of why I'm reading this text message thread right now. Please pray for Father Jason, for his friend Alan and these orphans that are getting out of Ukraine. He says this, very critical situation here. And they text back, miracle, all kids escaped Kiev area and arrived here yesterday. Today, Kiev is completely encircled. He's still there, by the way. It sounds like he, you know, he's left Kiev, but he's still in Ukraine, or at least was when he texted that. He says, unless St. Michael intervenes, it will be a humanitarian catastrophe unlike anything the world has seen since World War II. 21 orphans with me and Alan... <laughs> so cool man he's like we are making a dash to border today but need another miracle finding a bus so i'm like praying for him laying in bed at midnight so i can relate because on the way here <laughs> we had to stop by walgreens to get some mucinex right so i'm also dealing with similar exactly struggles. pain no, is amazing pain is, is relative <laughs> he says and i said i know there's a ton of people here praying for you we want to help like if we need to take some of these orphans adopt them or whatever let us know and he says I'll help, but first we need to get them out. Then pray they all receive visas. Very critical. We'll tell you more later. I said, okay, we're praying. He says, Putin is evil. And the silly phone. So-called Catholics who are praising him. He's like, mm. if I hear them do that again, I won't hold my tongue. Anyway, so they made it to a bus. They're on their way to Bosnia. So, so they're right. out They're out right now? They're not in Ukraine right now? That's right. Yeah. Cool. So... Isn't that cool? That's amazing. So pray for Father That's Jason. Amazing. And he's here, right? He's a student bell priest? Or? He is uh, in Carnegie, P Pittsburgh. No. Okay. Who cares? Yeah. It's student bell. Kind of John Henry, it is so good to have you on Dude, the show. I'm pumped. Yeah? I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about this morning that like you and I have been friends for a while, mm -hmm. a long time. And uh, you remember the early days of Pints with Aquinas before Trump even ran for so, presidency. So I remember the first, I remember when you made just the audio podcast, Yeah. right? Because I assigned the audio podcast to my kids when I was a theology teacher in Duluth, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I said they need to they had to just listen to the podcast like a 30-minute deal. Mm -hmm. And the first one was like an introduction to Aquinas and philosophy <laughs> and to mystic thinking and all of this stuff. And this precious ninth grade girl that I had walks up to me and she pulls up an iPad and she says, um, is this what you wanted us to listen to? Because your third or fourth or the most recent episode was Wet dreams. What, what, does, what does Thomas say on wet dreams? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, True story. Explain to this ninth grade girl. Like, no, 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 I'm so I'm sorry. So sorry. <laughs> I'll talk to him. No. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true, though. Just so everybody knows, Aquinas does address wet dreams. It's so crazy. And you can find out on episode <laughs> three. three or four of Finds with Aquinas. That's yeah. the only one that I remember that I got tucked away. But we're now like episode 528,000. That's wild. Oh. Yeah, I have a headache too. That's so funny. I was reading you those text messages this morning. Like, can we swing by Walgreens? Because I've got something in my I got some something in my nose. It's yeah, it's it's better now. I think it's the Pittsburgh whatever. I told you I just got Pollution. a second ago talking about Ukraine. Yeah. Ukraine releases prisoners with combat experience to fight in struggle oh my for our gosh, state. That's awesome. Isn't that awesome? Is he loud enough or should we push the mic closer to him? Uh you can pull it a little closer. Just oh, pull it a little cool. closer to your mouth. Here, you know. And Let's, my, and my we, mom texted me, what too. What did she just, say? So, I love you, Mom. Let's just read text messages. Yeah, really. The entire time. Yeah, she says, uh, I'm watching with your wife and kids. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. Nice. What if all we did for the next five hours is read updates on Ukraine? <laughs> we just, I was thinking we'd just share Ukraine memes back and forth. <laughs> you want to share the for one fun. you saw earlier? I'd rather or no? not. I don't, yeah, no, that's okay. I don't think so. 
Um, but anyway, it's really great to have you. You are, what's your role at St. John Bosco Academy? So my title is Dean of Academics. I'm like an assistant principal awesome. at a school. Yeah. Tell, tell people about that school. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, I, can I start a little before that yeah, school? Please. Can I start with it? I won't, I won't name names of schools because I, I, respect, uh, I respect a lot of the people who work in some of the schools that I've been at before. But I've worked in Catholic education for 12 years, maybe, 2000. 10, 2011, something like that, uh, since I got married, right, early on. And when I say I work in Catholic education, I mean that in the most, like, loose sense possible, right? Yeah. Lots of schools, especially where I was recently, before Bosco, that have, there's a crucifix, and yeah. they say the Hail Mary. There's a religion lesson. And then, that's it. Yeah, there's a religion lesson, but it's comparative, you know, whatever a lot of yeah. times. Just relativistic nothingness. Yep. Catholic education. Oh, you're sorry. Good, you're good. I was going to see a beautiful face. You got it. Yeah. Uh, and so I thought that's what it was. Right? We were looking at homeschooling. We were looking at all these different things. I was a principal of a school over in Gwinnett County and kind of had this big mission disagreement. Somebody who I loved dearly left, and I was no longer going to be able to run some things like I had run things. And I looked everywhere. I looked, I, we sent resumes to Lander, Wyoming, right? Wyoming Catholic College. I was looking at Beloit, Kansas. Um, uh, school up in New Ulm next to the convent where my sister-in-law is. We looked everywhere trying to find a, like an authentic place to go. And where I wanted to work, where I had forever, was a school called St. John Bosco that had no money. And I knew they couldn't afford me, right? It was not, because I'm not, I'm not expensive, but mm -hmm. I have to feed a wife and I've got four kids. Mm -hmm. She's pregnant with number five, so Woo. prayers, prayers, please. Uh, and so I reached out to, but I reached out to him anyway. And to Julie Wilborn, who's wonderful. She's yeah. one of the founders. Julie and Vivian, Kim McDonald. I owe my life and all the all my happiness right now to them, other than my family. <laughs> uh, you know, but I reached out to them. And I said, I know you don't have any jobs, but do you have any jobs? Like, can you pay me? <laughs> and they said no. Yeah. They said no. And then a month later, they said, Why don't you come in? Why don't you come in and hang out? And so I went. And so I, can I just pause yeah. for a second? Did you quit your previous job? How did, how did that work? You said, I did that thing you're not supposed to do, where you're in like a like a big meeting. And they say, well, we're letting somebody go. And then you say, well, if you're getting rid of them, you can kick my ass out. I mean, it was That's really, what you said. Yeah, I was like, I'll get out of here too. I didn't say it exactly yeah, like yeah. that. Um, you, I'll, I'll leave too. And yeah. so I did that. I yeah. sent in a letter of resignation okay. and like the clock was ticking. And you were like, Ange, we have no money. <laughs> Sorry, babe. We got to eat. Uh, but we worked it out. Cool. And I ended up going there. And I, I knew it was a good school. My, my son had gone there in pre-K. But then he left because my boss had said, hey, these are weird optics. You're the principal of our high school but your kid isn't going to our pre-K, our yeah. kindergarten. So we started homeschooling them exclusively because we wanted authentic, real-life Catholic education. And then we were, yeah, when I, when I went in to talk to him, I knew it was better, but I didn't know how good it was. And so we had this great meeting back and forth, and we were sitting at the table and talking about, you know, whatever, my philosophy of education and all this, and it was good. But then I said, can I go see, can I go sit in on some classes? Okay. Right? And I went and I sat in on, uh, I think it was a church history class, and little Miss Savannah Bell, she was a little, she's getting married this weekend, or not this weekend, this summer, okay. uh, June. They had read Humana Vitae the night before, right? And I've done this, man. Humana Vitae is all the stuff that's uncomfortable to talk about at the kitchen table. It's cool, right? I've taught it to that group full of kids, and it's like <clears> the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan, of just like, my mom says, and mm -hmm. hands up, and like everyone I've ever met on birth control, and I've been on birth control since I, since I was 11, and all yeah. of this stuff, right? And just yeah. starts pouring out as this back and forth. So I'm pumped. I'm going to sit in the back and just enjoy this slaughter take play. Not a part of it. Just yeah. watch this poor teacher who was good. I knew. She looked great. She, like, she had everything together. I knew these kids were just going to eat her alive. And I was so excited for that in a really terrible yeah. way. I was like watching a, watching a train, push that. train wreck. I can't get this mic right yeah, here. Just, just kind of keep it like that. You want me to just Because I, I want like them to this? hear the gold you're right, spitting right, out. Right, All right. right. So you're afraid for the teacher. So she stands up in front of the classroom, the teacher does, and she says, does anybody... Any thoughts? You read Humana Vitae last night. And Savannah Bell, this little girl in the front row, beautiful girl, friendly, just the kind of, you know, sort of your popular girl who looks like, she's got a lot of friends. She's really cool. She yeah. raises her hand. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, here we go. Here we go. And she says, so the effect of, um, I don't know how anybody could disagree with Paul VI when all of his predictions have come true. She sounds like Ben Shapiro. She was Ben Shapiro. Yeah, it turns out. <laughs> yeah. No, but then one after the other, all these kids are raising their hands and they're saying the same thing. Like, yeah, wow. 100%. Like, I mean, you look at the objectification of women and whatever, and I'm... Who are you? What is this? What is going on here? It was cool. Yeah, and, and that was my like kids. light bulb. Of, yeah, hundred percent. I don't care what they pay me. I don't right. care if they can. You know, they can just give me like food stamps and. So like prior to that donuts. moment, were you just did you think like all Catholic schools are done? There's I no knew such that thing Bosco good... was better, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how good. I knew that the administration was better, yeah. right? 
And that tends to be what happens. You have admin where you got a really solid theology department or a really solid principal, but there's this whole mechanism of we need money and butts and seats, so we're yeah. going to sacrifice mission, right? We're going to sacrifice all the things that make it authentically Catholic to make sure that we can keep the doors open. Mm-hmm. It's what everywhere does. What's your take on Catholic? So you got a great school you're at. It's a hybrid mm-hmm. school, right? They come a couple of days a week? Yeah, so K through 8, they're there two days. You're either Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. And then high school's Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. What's your take on Catholic education as a whole in general? Like America-wide? Yeah. Like in your it's, experience, because you've been a principal. A different, yeah. How right? so? No, totally. I, I mean, I think it all comes back to... That's a good idea. I'm going to do that in a second, too. I think it all goes back to this idea of we want to be good schools that are Catholic, as opposed to we want to be good Catholic schools. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Right? And so... The concern is we got to get kids into good colleges. We got to get uh, make sure they're all NCAA, whatever, so our athletes can do it. Make sure they get lots of scholarships and they're eligible for all these, whatever. I'm the dean of academics. That's my title. Mm-hmm. I don't care about academics at all. I say that at the open house, and that's <laughs> maybe that's a little. Tough. I care <laughs> no, about no, it. Push but into like that. This much. Why don't you care about academics? Because it's the least important thing you're doing when you're 14, 15, 16 years old. Good grades are convenient, right? Like money. Money is convenient. But it's not what's important, right? Mm. I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. I'm not the person. I'm not working to be the man that I'm supposed to be because I have a lot of money or because I got good grades. Who cares? Right? Here's education. And this is Catholic education, but it's education in general, right? Little Johnny. I normally stand up and do this, so I'm having a hard time sitting still, (laughs) but I'm going to do it. Little Johnny is born. Look at precious little Johnny. He's a child of God, and he's beautiful, and he's he's good. His mind is blank. He's just going to be filled with goodness, right? And we take little Johnny, and probably little Johnny's mommy and daddy works. Little Johnny goes to daycare. Right? And then when Johnny turns four, we put Johnny on this assembly line. Right? And little Johnny spends the next, what, 12 years or whatever going down this assembly line of a little bit of math and a little bit of science. And oh, here's some foreign language and here's some help. Oh, and if I'm at a Catholic school, we'll say the Hail Mary before we learn about that. Mm-hmm. And we, we go down to the end of the assembly line where we get the privilege of going to college on another little assembly line where all I'm doing day in, day out with my education is I'm consuming information to then regurgitate onto a test so that I can do it again, right? Over and over and over again. And at the end of that, if I go through college, right, then I get the privilege, little Johnny does, of paying taxes until the day that I die. And who cares? Who cares? Your grades don't matter. I want want kids to get good grades. It's nice. It makes my life easier. That's for sure. It's more convenient. Because if everybody's getting Fs, they're like, what's going on in your classes? But we get, I mean, I can brag on colleges, right? We get kids into good schools and everything. Notre Dame and Columbia, if that's what you're about. But I get more excited about the fact that uh, we've got a couple of our kids getting married this summer, some alumni who yeah. are fantastic, awesome, well-formed kids who are fulfilling their vocation. I'll brag about that. I don't care about so what, what, Miller sh- what should it look like? Is it, you know, if, if you were to kind of, hey, good luck, this thing's almost dead. We might have to borrow your matchbox. Right. But like if you were to try to rewrite that, you're talking about little Johnny going to school, being on the conveyor belt, I'd want to know what that looks like, and I'm going to keep talking until you've lit your hey, cigar. Keep, There's yeah, no way you're going to get that. No way. Do you Can want to I throw in that at him? Yeah. Huh. Thank you. So wait, so what's the question? If I could rewrite it? Yeah, so like you're a critic of putting little Johnny on the conveyor belt as you see it and him going through school and regurgitating information and then going onto another conveyor belt and then paying taxes and dying. How, 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 so, all right, what should it look like? I mean this to sound less tongue-in-cheek than, I'm, than it's going to sound, but I think we should start by, if I could do it my way, taking a match to 90% of the schools. Right? We have to re I mean seriously, I I will I will say out loud publicly, I don't think public education is a great thing. No. Necessarily. No. Right. I don't think I don't think that we have a right to education that should be provided by our government or anything mm. like that. And we didn't, right? And I don't know a whole know, lot about the history of education. Yeah. I mean I can't dig dig yeah, into yeah. it. But in the early twentieth century, there weren't public schools everywhere. You had parochial schools that were incredibly affordable, mm-hmm. right? Or free through parishes or people who tithed. There's still is Kansas City or somewhere out there where the bishop says, if you tithe, yeah, where is that? Then you're forget, free. Yeah. Your, your Catholic tui- tuition is paid for. Yeah, but it has to. It, it goes deeper than just burning down schools, which is great. Right? I'm not endorsing domestic terrorism on here. I'm not saying we should. I'm not saying you should do that. Whoever's watching from St. John Bosco, don't do that. But I think we have to reimagine, or not reimagine, just remember the purpose of education in general. Which is what. Fulfilling vocations and salvation. I mean, yeah. that's everything, right? Salvation yeah. is everything. The goal is to get little Johnny into heaven. Yeah. And that sounds cheesy, and dumb, but it's true. Yeah. It's 100% it's the true. the way things are. And 
when you when you orient what you're doing around that and you say things out loud like listen your grades are it's it's good to get good grades that'll make your life easier but really what i care about is you little johnny right i love you mm-hmm. and i say that to kids all the time it sounds awkward right when you're we're saying it on here, but they, they vouch for me. I wish we brought a crew of them in here. Like, I, I love you. Like, I love you as mm-hmm. an individual, not you as one of my students. I love you, Matt, mm-hmm. right? And I want what's best for you. And if you fail a couple of classes, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. We'll get you back there because we love you. And I, want you to, I want you to be saved. Yeah. I wonder if people's sh- mentality is shifting on this altogether. Like, I know I grew up in Australia and university wasn't something that people did i made right. not even half of my graduating class went to university because it, it's not like it is here in america I remember when i started dating my wife cameron telling her parents i hadn't been to university felt like so, telling someone in australia i didn't go to high school that's you interesting know? yeah yeah and uh but i feel like a lot of americans are, are kind of thinking yeah why are we doing this why are we getting in tons mountains of debt just so you can come out with some useless I don't degree think, i don't think enough are i mean i think we've just had sort of this pipeline forever of if you want to be successful you go to college we were talking to that the truck driver the other day, the yeah. cigar bar, who was talking about his uh, whatever his union president or something was sweeping, mm. and mom said to her little child, and he overheard her saying, "If you if you want to grow up to be like that guy, then you you won't go to college," and that's ridiculous. Yeah, this is, this is a terrible thing to be telling kids. But colleges in general, I mean, I like college. I'm all about college, but I'm not all about what 90% of people do. I'm, I'm a big fan of like the liberal arts sort of, no, you should go here because learning is worth doing, mm. right? You should learn because it's good for you and you, it'll help you achieve salvation eventually. Mm. That's why you should be here. Not to make more money for whatever. Yeah, no, it is it is nuts how things have de-escalated, have, have regressed. Well, how many people go to college and get a degree in history or something so that they can go be a hostess at Applebee's yeah, for the rest of their life, right? Yeah, I got a degree in history. Then I went. I was a firefighter. Yeah, I, I know. I don't care really. It's funny. I like. I see my kids advancing, uh, even just in the discussions we have. Mm-hmm. You know, um, kind of Socratic back and forth about government and Biden sure. and salvation and different religions. I see them thinking critically. I see them as happy children. Because I'm like you. Like I actually don't really care that much if my kids know all this stuff. It would be nice, and I'm all about trying to make it happen, right. but not at the expense of sending them to some awful school that's gonna endanger their souls and indoctrinate them into the LGBTQ stuff or whatever. I think practically speaking, college is really great for networking. It's really good for spouse shopping. And it's really good if you want to be a structural engineer, right? If you have a very definitive, you know, I want to be a surgeon. I want to be an aviator technician or something like that, right? That makes sense. Mm. But so many of us just go because we're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. It's a stupid reason to go. Mm. Okay. Yeah, like my daughter's homeschooled right now, and she's learning how to crochet and cook and mm-hmm. bake, and she goes to gymnastics. Can you she, say she, she's making you a quilt. She's right making now? me a quilt. She's so beautiful. She's one of the most interesting individuals That's I've amazing. ever had the pleasure of knowing. And I know she'll make a beautiful wife one day. Should God right. call her to that vocation? She's happy. She's got friends. But we're not. I'm so glad we're not sending her to these Catholic schools. But listen, when we talk negatively about Catholic schools, we mm-hmm. offend a ton of sure. people. And I really am not in the business of just offending people for right, fun. Right, right. And I also know that there are a lot of good people who love their Catholic school and really hope that it's going to mm-hmm. work out. And what do we know? I haven't visited every Catholic school. Right. Maybe you're sending your kid to a great Catholic school. So I'm, you know. Well, I want to say, too, that there's a lot of really great people involved in Catholic schools. But just from, from sort of the big picture structural business model of these schools you have to sacrifice mission in order to keep these schools open right yeah. you've got you have to have a thousand people on right butts and seats every day in order to keep the lights on and the teachers paid and to continue to move this thing forward that you have created that is tried so desperately to keep up with the public school system mm. why bosco why my school is great right and there's a lot of schools like it's not just bosco but i'm a fan of bosco right yeah but why it's great i think is because it was founded, it was created by people who were totally unqualified to start a school. And that's not a knock on my bosses, right? Yeah. That's a huge thumbs up. We're good because they came in with this like, how do you do this? I don't know, we'll figure it out. Uh, there's there none of this, here's how you do this. Schools are supposed to be like this, or mm. this is the policy that every other school has when we do this. And that's been amazing. What, f- what freedom, uh, you know, because we're talking about good Catholic schools versus like run-of-the-mill Catholic schools mm-hmm. at this point. What things are you able to do in this good Catholic school mm-hmm. that you weren't in other Catholic schools? I think a lot of it, the most important stuff I do is outside the classroom, for starters. So I teach an ancient history class, 
on ancient Greek and ancient Roman history up through the fall of the Roman Empire. And then I teach a theology of the body class to juniors, right? Mm -hmm. So before we leave history, we're getting a lot in chat about uh, Rome fell in 476 AD. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are there's my those are probably my kids. From yeah, 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 there's before. a lot of them in here. They're all saying they know you. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm a big fan. I love you guys. I do. Um, yeah, so I so I teach so I teach those two classes, and that's great, right? The classroom stuff is is it's fun, and you can talk about whatever. But the stuff that's not part of the curriculum, because we have to check boxes, so the state of Georgia says our diplomas count, mm -hmm. right? I want kids to be able to go to college and make a lot of money and donate it to an endowment fund and, you know, then whatever. But I want them to go to heaven more. So most of the important stuff comes in conversations with the kids, things that I can talk about, things that I, I would not be allowed, things that would get me fired to talk about anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I can sit down with a group of kids on Fridays, for instance, right? So I teach ancient history Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And on Fridays, we don't talk about history. We talk about things that you should talk about. And that can be anything. It can be, uh, we're going to talk about transgenderism. That's big in the news today. We can talk about the Ukraine. That's big in the news. We can talk about LGBTQ stuff. We can talk about um, what it means to be a man, like to be masculine or to be feminine or to what. And the older they get, the more open they are. And by junior year, Theology of the Body, the entire, every time we meet, that's what it is. It's what are you dealing with, right? Hmm. What, what do you need? Because like loving the kids is great. That's cute. We all say that. Right? We're not different because we love kids. Yeah, Every school is going to say that they love their kids. But we're different because, at least I think, at least our goal, what we're hoping to, they need to know that they are loved. Right? They need, to, they need to understand, not just you say you love me, but you do love me. And when, mm. I, when I bring something up, and I've got that vulnerability, because we're all pathetic, right? We're all broken and disordered and... Yeah, in desperate just, needs of in need of affirmation and affirmation and, who, and, and and identity. We're in need of identity. That's what I love about our school. Is there's this. We'll say who we are, right? There's a healthy tribalism that mm. exists there. Every other school I've ever worked in, there are all these kids who are constantly kind of moaning and whatever about. Sorry, I'm trying to curse on your show, mm. uh, but. Who are, who are always complaining about, oh, I wish you went here, I wish you went there. We've got a couple of those. But whereas the typical Catholic school, I think, is like 90% not great. Yeah. Just like the public school, right? It's like the, it's just a public school with money. 90% yeah. of the kids are into all the crap and whatever. Yeah. And 10% are like, really? They're, they're good kids and they're fighting and they're striving and whatever. I think we're the inverse. I think 90% of our kids are That's awesome. That's really great. Like positive peer pressure is a dumb And do you word, attribute that to the parents sending the kinds of parents and families totally. they're growing up in? Or totally. is it the way you school them or yeah, both? Yeah, I mean, I'd love for us to take credit for it, but it's mostly parents. Yeah. It's mostly, there's all sorts of filters of weirdness to do this thing. Because first of all, it's, you're only in school three days a week, right? Which means you probably have a parent, you got to have a parent who's staying home. Or a kid's got to be willing to come to work with mom or Neil, dad. Neil, would you mind putting a link to St. John Bosco Academy in the description? Oh, it's the worst website ever. Are you sure you want to do that? Well, I, I mean, I just want to let people know, like, we're not here to promote John Bosco Academy. We're here to talk about good Catholic education. And I think you've told me you're actively discouraging people from from joining the school at this point. No, I don't no? know if we're actively discouraging, but we're no. Just because you have so many, not. I thought. We have, yeah, we've got waiting lists across yeah. the board. But the only right? point, I, don't bring, I just want people to know this is not like a gigantic ad for John Bosco, but if people are interested in looking at a hybrid school, I mean, there's others like Regina Chaley Academy and other great right. schools out there. They well, I will say that we last updated our website in like 1994. <laughs> it looked horrible. I'm <laughs> almost positive my name's not even on it anywhere. I've been there for three years. Oh, funny. Which is All not right. a knock, well, but uh, what I said, I actually suggested this. I said to, uh, I said to our admissions director a while back, can we just, instead of the website, just do a, di a direct link to me just listing off things that are going to offend people and scare them away from the school? What would that look like? Um, Let's record it right now. We'll send it to Julie Wilborn. We'll, 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 we'll make this a clip. Go. No, every, so every <laughs> single interview, when I sit down with parents, right, I say, we're going to tell your child birth control is mortally sinful. Uh -huh. We're going to tell your child that dudes can't marry each other. We're going to tell your child that masturbation and pornography, and we're not going to do this when they're seven, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But by the time they're in high school, yeah. we're having those conversations because we're, we're, we're serious, yeah. right? It's capital T truth. It's yeah. orthodox, legit. And have you ever Catholic. had parents be offended by I've you I had saying, one walk out. How, what happened? Tell me about that. She just stood up and said, thank you so much. I don't think we need to continue. And I said, great. Bye. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> and good. You don't waste your time and she don't have to waste her time. Well, because I think it's a track. So I'm going to quote Osama bin Laden. Great. All right. Okay. <laughs> good. Let's do it. <laughs> so, and I, th I, I think this was attributed to him a long time ago. It's probably it goes deeper. But he said... Something to the effect of when a man sees when a young man sees a strong horse and a young man sees a weak horse, he's always going to go with the strong horse. Yeah. Right. 
And that's what's happening in our society right now is when you're dumbing down the the, the, the church and you're dumbing down truth and goodness and you look at it and instead of seeing like I remember that when I sort of had my yep. little reversion to Catholicism yep. I was I wanted shields and swords in churches I didn't want some effeminate man with a purple banner and a sheep on it uh, like Absolutely. telling me to be nice right and so we need that strength and we need that identity our kids are desperate for mm-hmm. that and they don't have it I was I was thinking the other day I, I, I was talking to a group of kids about this, I think, or a group of parents. Do you remember in the, I guess from the 90s on or whatever, your Bill O'Reilly's and all your talking heads would talk about the culture war, mm-hmm. right? As if there were this culture of sort of right-wing values and this culture of left-wing values, yeah. right? And they were in competition against one another. But I, th- I don't like that at all. I don't, I don't like that because there's not a culture war. Mm-hmm. There's not a culture war. There's a, there's a culture, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's people who believe things are true and real. And then there's a nothing. There's a malaise, relativistic, empty, tapioca colored noth- nothingness. I don't know why it's tapioca colored, <laughs> but that's all. That's the way I always think of that. And that's what we're fighting against. Yeah, we're, I'm not worried any of our kids, uh, any Catholic kids who are solid in their faith right now. I'm not worried that any of them are going to go off and be converted by like Joey the Presbyterian, who's like, "Hey, buddy, will you mind?" Uh, right? That's that's never going to happen. Yeah. I'm worried they're going to fall into this agnostic, atheistic nothingness. I I said, and I got an email about this. I would rather my son grow up and join the Taliban or ISIS or any objectively evil organization than have him grow up and just be, you know, a dad who really likes football. And oh, you're going to have to explain this wife, because yeah. I, I'm, I, I like where you're going. No, no, let me, let me continue. I'm not done with we've my done Osama bin Laden and now it's the Taliban. Yeah, yeah. And that's fine, Leah. It's <laughs> <laughs> like within uh, five minutes. No, but some... I think most people in our culture, right? That's what masculinity is, right? We, I watch football. I really like my lawn. Yeah. You know, and my, my wife probably doesn't respect me and my kids grow up and they don't really return my calls and I, I don't really stand for anything. I don't have any fire burning in me. I just, just sort of exist and the end yeah. will be all of my existence is just be nice. Just don't hurt people's feelings. I don't want to do that. Yeah. No, like that, that's awful. And the reason I'm saying I would rather my kid join some horrible organization as opposed to that mm. because then at least he's burning for I can work with a fire yeah right? he's burning for something he's got something in there and that's yeah. what so many of our kids don't have yeah it's pathetic it's so I, sad. I see that when I go and speak at Catholic schools a lot of the time I, mm-hmm. I, I look out at people and I just you know maybe it's just me imposing my preconceived ideas upon them but they just seem sort of glazed glazed over and uninterested and I heard it, I, it was Dr. Andrew Swafford who said to me and he's somebody who teaches at um What's that? It's Kansas school, university in Kansas. Benedictine? Yeah, Benedictine. Half of our kids go there every year. He <laughs> said, "He said I'm convinced because he said you can, you can. There's a notable difference between those who are homeschooled and those who go to regular school. Noticeable difference." And he says, "I'm convinced that if all you did was read the Lord of the Rings or other good mm-hmm. books to your kids on the couch, your house is a mess, whatever. Sure, they would end up head and shoulders sure. above those who go to school. Why do you? What, you do you, I, I know you agree with that. Why is? Why do you think that's the case?" I think that school, and it's not school, it's society. It's just modern. What I mean, I can rant and sound like a conspiracy theorist about Hollywood and the media and whatever. Yeah. No, but I feel like everything is directed towards the tearing down of culture and identity to be replaced with nothing. That was me yeah. when I was a kid. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what, what my identity was or my culture. And my parents, who I loved to death, right? My father was the best man at my wedding, <laughs> right? A lot of the focus was just be nice. Like, Help people when they need to be helped. Yeah. And and whatever. And don't disrespect other people's views. But it wasn't like here but here's what we believe. It ought to be yeah. this is what yeah. we stand for. Yeah. Unapologetically. Totally. We're not pulling punches. Yep. And then there's all the other stuff. And you should still be nice, sure. But if the end will be all of like what you're trying to raise your kid to be is a nice guy, mm. it's gross. Who cares? Yeah, it, yeah, I agree. In high school we were taught the kind of aboriginal dream story myths mm-hmm. with more seriousness than we were religious truths that mm-hmm. were actually factual. Right. Um, and, and, and here's another sort of indictment kind of against this society. When I came to Christ at the age of 17, I just wanted to be radical for Jesus Christ. And for me, that meant just become a priest. And so sure. I was all about becoming a priest. And my mom, who was nervous about that and who wanted grandkids, God bless her, said, why don't you just become a social worker? Because exactly. I think in her mind, a priest is a social worker who doesn't have people. sex. Right. That's it. That's the only difference. But I think that's everywhere. I mean, 
the number of atheists, and I don't know where the stat comes from. I could be making it up, but I'm pretty sure I've read this. Comes from right? here. The number, I heard on Pines with Aquinas. <laughs> the, the number of atheists that we have in the world is decreasing, mm-hmm. while the number of agnostics is exploding. Once again, I'll take a militant atheist ah, absolutely. over to like, stand for something. Yeah. Have a ba- and we all want that, and we have to have that almost like worked out of us by a culture that doesn't care. It's relativism, right? It's modernist nothingness. Mm-hmm. It's like an undue epistemological um, modesty or an inordinate epistemological modesty where someone just stands back and refuses to make a choice because maybe they've been told that everything's true or you only have your truth and so it doesn't really matter. And so we just sort of stand back because we don't want to offend anybody. And if I take any kind of position, although I say that, but I mean, look at the militant left in this country today. What are they standing for? That's what they're doing, though. They're, they're filling that gap with anything, literally oh, anything. It I can see. be, um, I should cut off my penis and become a woman. Yeah. Right? I, I, I have to have something that's, that's, that's me that makes me special. And I, can, mm. I should cover myself. And I'm not knocking tattoos in general, but you see this all the time. Let me cover myself with, with yeah. tattoos and whatever and carry around the big rainbow banner because I just desperately need something to stand for. Please. Yeah. Please. I'm here. I want to be noticed. I want to be seen. I want to be a part of something. And I don't have that. I'm out on this plank from the time that I was a little baby just told to be nice and that your opinion is just as good as so-and-so's and and there is no truth. I mean, Mm -hmm. we say that openly, right? No, I'm with you. Your truth, live your truth. When you talk about an effeminate church, we Mm -hmm. completely get that, but but speak to that a bit more. Help us understand what you mean by that and what we need to change if we're going to have any To to have an effeminate church, you know? I mean, I can tell you what I think the the solution is to the effeminate church. Uh, Waiting around until these guys die. I know mean, that sounds horrible, but and I've heard people complain about well, the College of Cardinals is stacked in this direction, and there's no way we're going to get we're going to have sort of these modernist, you know, kind of baby boomer, immediate post Vatican II. I'm not some anti Vatican II guy, but these these popes forever. No, we're not. Like I just I went for a walk this morning in Pittsburgh, hmm. and I ended up popping into mass and, and speaking. I don't even know what his name was, Father whoever. He's probably 30 years old. On fire, talked to me for way longer than I wanted to talk. Masculine just, dude, um, yeah, from masculine Africa. from the depths of Africa. Mm-hmm. Oh, dude, you give me a, give me a pope from the anywhere. Just walk through a rainforest <laughs> at the equator in Africa. Find a Catholic the first man. First guy you see, make him pope. I'm down. And it's hilarious, right? You look at like the Amazonian synod, or whatever synods are going on. I know I'm all over the place, but mm. and. The Germans are all there, like we should ordain women deacons and mm-hmm. um, divorced people should get married. Or should might be okay the now. Meanwhile, there's like the dude from Uganda sitting in the back who's uh, Boko Haram uh, killed uh, 14 nuns at a convent. Uh, can we talk about actual problems? Yeah. Like it's beautiful. Like they get it. Mm-hmm. They they understand because they haven't lived in our Western decadent nothingness where we mm-hmm. don't feel like we have real problems, so we invent these stupid made up problems. But you do see a return to a desire for traditional um, gender roles, sex roles, right? You, you, you see a desire for that and a leaning into that. E- even in secular ways, like the, the art of manliness, I don't know sure. if that's a Christian guy who runs that or what, but there, there is this desire. You see that in the traditional movement, right? Where it's like men want to treat themselves with respect and so they dress in a suit uh, or, or whatever. And um, again, the point isn't to demonize people who don't wear suits to mass. The point is just to say like there's this longing for something but, yeah, but sometimes that comes off as artificial. But what do you think? I think kids in particular are going to gear towards what they see as the the strong horse, right? Yeah. Over and over and over again. And if mom and dad aren't presenting, here is here is who we are. If you're not gifting your child an identity, we're made to have identities. We're made to live in communities with similar people, with mm-hmm. like-minded people, right? Which is another thing I love about Bosco. It's another thing I love about a Regina Chaley or any of these small Catholic communities. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't show that strength, especially as dads, I blame everything on dads, yeah. just about, right? But if, they, if, if you don't have somebody in your life showing you that strength and sort of grabbing you and saying, come on, this is you, this is us, here's what we're doing. It can be anything, right, to fill that void, because we all want that void filled. Yeah. But if you don't have somebody doing that and pointing you in the correct direction, then you're gonna find, you're gonna find something else to fill it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can talk about anything from the transgender stuff to gangs to a hundred different People are uh, PETA, right? Whatever it is. Yeah. You're going to fill that with some radical strength from somewhere because mm-hmm. we have to have that. Yeah, we want to be dogmatic about something. Something. We It'll have to. It'll either be truth or something else. That's why the left, it's a, it's a religion, right, in yeah. a lot of ways. It really feels like mm-hmm. that. I often say that the uh, the mask is to wokeism what the scapular is to Catholicism. 100%. It just seems 100%. like a token of group identity. Because we want that. 
we think we're beyond that. We, we, we pretend we lie to ourselves and say, no, that's old, like tribalistic, you know, living in the woods, painting mm-hmm. ourselves, whatever. Like, no, that's you. That's, they yeah. were just as human as you are. They, they are, were the exact same. They had the same souls and the same concupiscence and the same brokenness and the same desire for belonging that you have back then. And we can't pretend like we're past it. So when you talk to your teens about masculinity and femininity, like what does that look like and how do they respond to it? So I'm actually doing something for homework for my Theology of the Body class this week that I'm really excited about, um, sort of in that same, same vein. Um, I had them all write for homework 10 non-physical attributes that they find attractive in members of the opposite sex okay. and 10 non-physical attributes that they find unattractive, right? So attractive and unattractive. And then I read them all out loud, right? I don't say... You know, Penny Sabala says that she really likes guys who are this, right? I don't do that. Yeah. Um, but what we do is we, I, I read these out loud and they're all beautiful. They really are. I mean, some kids will just write 10 quick bullet points. Yeah. I had a kid last year who wrote like a tome, like one of these guys of just <laughs> like a paragraphs on each. Wow. And the guys will always say, here's what I want, right? I want someone who's, who's loving and nurturing. They'll say like good sense of humor and stuff. Someone who's good with kids. Who's what they'll say all these traditionally feminine, authentic, beautiful things about, you know, what, they, what they really find attractive. And then the girls will say, I want someone who is strong. I want someone who respects me. I want someone who doesn't use bad language, you know, when he's out with me or make dirty jokes in front of me. I want somebody who respects themselves, somebody who's not addicted to pornography. And the point of that is so I can look these guys and look these girls in the eye and say, see, they want you to be like you want to be. Because I still believe that. I do believe that we all want to be that, right? We sacrifice our dignity. We sacrifice our masculinity, our authentic masculinity for the sake of being this cartoonish whatever that we feel like we have to be or Mm. else we're going to be left alone we're not going to be we're going to be lonely Mm. and so we're willing to sacrifice our dignity and our self-worth to do that i was talking to girls in class friday i think and we were talking about girls who post pictures right online or send nudes or send you know lots of bikini pictures or lingerie pictures that they send around and all of them all of them were saying, we don't, nobody wants to do that. The girls, yeah. They're doing that because they're just, they're desperate for attention. Yeah. Love me. Yeah. Please love me. That's what we're all doing. I'm just as broken as they are. Yeah. I always, I keep coming back to that because it's really important to say out loud. Yeah. I can, I can point to anybody who's listening to this right now, right? And you and Neil and whoever, and I can tell you all the things about you because I'm doing the same thing, right? You worry that you're not good enough and that you're not lovable and that you're not mm-hmm. interesting enough, right? And we're, we're all just little balls of self-conscious whatever because we're fallen and we're broken. Mm. And you have to acknowledge it. You have to reach down and engage out loud with those things. Um, you brought up a great point last night. We were drinking bourbon at a pub in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. and you pointed out how you hate when men say they have a man cave, and I just love that. And <laughs> sure, I just, yeah, I know yeah. this is the nice thing about long form discussions. We just talk about what we want to talk I love about. It. Doesn't have to go in any kind of order. I love yeah, it. so tell us about that. So, what does a man cave say, right? A man cave says, My house, my castle is my wife's. Yeah. But I'm relegated to this room. And in this <laughs> With room, my football I can put all <laughs> my cool stuff up, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's gross. It is gross. I really, I, I, I I've hate never that thought idea. of that before. Yeah, you're uh, you're supposed to be the head of your household. Yeah, right? it's supposed to be your castle. And I I don't care at all about the interior design of my home. Like mm-hmm. my wife, we're, we're building a house right now. We've got the architect plans done. All of this is great. Angie has had a big hand in it, mm-hmm. but I have come in and said, no, I really want a wood burning fireplace, and I really want a big front porch, and I really want a. I think I, I keep calling it poop closet. But I think it's a water closet. You know, the toilet that's separate from the Absolutely. shower area. Yep. That way, while Every I'm going toilet to the bathroom, in Australia is like that. Th- that's beautiful. Why, that's yeah. what I want to why, talk why about you for poop four hours. You shower. Right. And what is that about America? Well, and I've got five little kids, right? And, and a puppy right now. Uh-huh. And so I'll be going to the bathroom and just see hands. Like, <laughs> you ever seen the movie Signs? Yeah. Yeah, like that. <laughs> just trying to get in at me. But so anyway, right? I was saying, no, oh, here's the things I want. And then when we decorate or whatever, I've got. I'm a big hunter, right? Mm-hmm. I've got deer heads. I want a deer head over the piano or or whatever. And I'm not just going to say, no, you make this your feminine paradise. And I'll take the, the shed out back. Maybe we could wire some electricity to it, pretty please, darling. Mm. You know? I think it's gross. I think it's pathetic. But what, and what's interesting, too, is the woman doesn't want a husband who's like that either. Mm-hmm. It, it's not like the woman wants an emasculated, effeminate man. But I feel like a lot of times they feel like they kind of have to have to settle in a way. Right. Well, I think if a woman's only options are 
a, a tyrannical husband who looks at porn, doesn't care about her. Right. Now, if that's what you're dealing with, sure, then an emasculated husband who's relegated to there does seem better. Well, those are but two. Those, those are, are two, two options. bad options. Those, yeah. are, those are the two options that we feel like are presented to us. Yeah. I can be effeminate and weak and meek, or I can be just this brazen machismo, whatever. Yeah. Who, by the way, those guys, at least in my experience, their whole masculinity is driven by just like consumerism, things that I'm told to be masculine, right? Like I like flannel. And this particular football team, and I got this big old truck, and I got all these things that I've spent money on to demonstrate how much of a man I am. Yeah. And that's gross. Be yeah. authentic. Be real. Love the hell out of your children. Literally. I always say that. Yeah, that's I good. I love like the that. hell out of the. And that's the goal at school with these with those kids, right? Love the hell to out love them too. so much, the hell goes away. Love your kids. Love your wife. Be a man in yeah. a real sense of the word, not what you feel like you're supposed to be, because. You have permission from media and politics to be this kind of a man. Does that yeah, make sense? It makes complete sense. St. John Chrysostom, in his commentary on Ephesians 5, you know, wives submit, husbands love. You know, he says, you want your wife to submit to you? Uh, ha make her submit in the way Christ made the church submit. Not through tyranny, not through domination, but by laying his life down for her. Mm -hmm. And I can think of three particular instances I'm going to just think about this on the spot right now, that show that women want to submit to their husbands, right? Or right. This is the typical thing, and we'll go over them here. I actually have to enumerate them here. All right, so here's... Yeah, you want to... yeah, no, I was just going to say, my, we had Ephesians 5 at our wedding. Yeah, us too. 11 years yeah. ago or something. I think, I... That, I think the thing is, though, like if you, if you read one without the context of the other, yeah, it's lopsided. Oh. But what I often find Catholics doing is they're so ashamed of reading hus wives submit that they very quickly dismiss it. And what they'll say is, oh, yeah, but submit means put yourself under the mission of, and the husband has mm -hmm. to die to his wife. So, I mean, who has sure. a better deal here? Right. And that's true, right? There's this, that's right. What they just said is true, but what they just said was to dismiss the real thing that St. Paul just told women to do. And I don't like that. Like, you have to face it. If you want to be a Christian, you should take the Bible seriously. My aunt came up and, like, confronted my mother-in-law after our wedding and said, like, can you believe that they put that in there? It was really uncomfortable. What yeah. do you mom say? My mother-in-law, and I have no oh, idea. Oh, your mother-in-law. So my yeah. my mother-in-law is, is not the kind of woman who would have just sort of jumped out her throat afterwards and okay. gone into like a theological discussion of St. John Chrysostom. Okay. <laughs> but but look, 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 look at three ways that men and women interact that show that women actually want to submit to their male partner, right? Yeah. The first is, and I use this as, a, as an analogy, I want to see how your experience adds up to this, right? When I was dating Cameron and she was in Texas and I was in Australia, I missed her so much. I think about her all the time. I would stay up to three in the morning, even though I had to get up at seven to go to work, just to hear her voice. You know, yeah. I loved her. I was writing music about her. I mean, she, I love her still. When I would daydream about her, I would daydream about holding her. Mm -hmm. And when she would daydream about me, she would daydream about being held being by held. me. Right. It like would that. be weird if I was like, I just wanted to hold me. Right. Unless I was like in, in undergoing some sort of trauma. Sure. And it would be weird if she's like, I just wish he were in my arms right now. Like maybe there's a sense in which you'd want that. And I like that. Certainly yeah. you can think of times where that would be appropriate. But no, the man gives the embrace. The woman wishes to receive it. The man wishes to give it. All right. There's the first example. Here's a second example. Men ought to propose marriage to their wives. 100%. Now, in that awful but somewhat funny sitcom series Friends, Chandler you know, tried to propose to Monica. It was actually a very funny scene. He couldn't get through it because he kept crying. So she kneels down and proposes sure. to him. That's gross. Uh, if you're going to propose to your fiance, find somebody else. Well, but, but, he, but just, 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 let me just say this real no, quick. Sure. He wants to, it's his, he's the initiator. So there's a second example. The man is the initiator. The woman is the receiver. But I want to go a little deeper on that one. Yeah. Do you know why? At least what I think why? is the reason why. Why I think it's inappropriate for girls to ask guys out or to ask guys to go to the dance with them or to ask them to marry them or whatever. Because it's a, it's a courage thing. It's a fortitude yeah. thing. As the man, right, and as the 14-year-old boy, right, I'm called to put myself out there yeah. to face the rejection in a way that you're not. You're the girl in this situation. Yep, that's right? fine. And I have to look you in the eyes and say, will you go to the dance with me? And that, is a, that takes a lot of courage. Yeah. That's a hard thing to do. I even told the kids at school, you can't make the signs that say prom, question mark, don't do that. You're a loser. You have to say, hey, so-and-so, will you please go to the dance with me? Good. Because I hope you call them rejection. losers. What? I hope you do call them losers for doing that. Yeah, because I losers. feel like they really need to be invited mm -hmm. to something better. Mm -hmm. So there again, we have in the hug example, the initiator and the receiver. What's the third? The third is the sexual embrace. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to get 
detailed here, but I am going to talk about it, so for those who want to maybe check out, but the idea is that a man literally has to rise to the occasion, right. give oh, his sure. strength, sure. and the woman actually has to receive him. And, right. he, and he, can't, he can't force that gift upon her. Like, he has to... He has to woo her. He has to, you know, he has to lead her into that sort of receptive mode. She mm -hmm. wishes to receive his strength. So there's just three examples. I think of the, you know, I think all those three things are prophetic right. of of what does it mean to be man? What does it mean to be woman? And 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 the and what we're, what I'm not saying is that you have to f fit into a particular stereotype or a particular. Um, uh, what do you say, like a, a personality type. Right. That's not what I'm saying. Like my wife is probably the strongest, most powerful woman I've ever met. I love her. I've seen you guys physically wrestle. We, yeah, we physically yeah. wrestle. Yeah, we because yeah. we, it's if I physically wrestle my wife and I lose, I lose. If right. I win, I lose. Right. You know, I'm not going to wrestle my wife and beat her in front of you right. and then be like, yeah, <laughs> chest bump. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it's like, yeah, she's powerful. And so it's not about s saying, well, adopt some meek, weird attitude that you think women ought to have. Nor is it about, as you say, the machismo thing. Well, it's but weird. A lot of times <clears throat> it sounds like girls will think they're being infantilized, right? Whenever you talk about femininity versus masculinity, mm. right? And it comes off that way sometimes, yeah, right? Because yeah. when I'm talking to a group of guys and I'm saying... Guys, listen, I'm, I'm not super concerned with the fact that you're dropping an F-bomb when you're talking to your guy friends, you know, outside or whatever. You shouldn't. It's impolite. People get over here, but you're not committing some grave sin or mm -hmm. something like that. It is a very big deal if you're doing it or you're making sexual jokes or you're doing it when there's a female there. Because there's a respect that is owed to her as the fair sex. Women are the, like, pinnacle of God's creation. Mm -hmm. right, we need to remember that. God creates everything else, then he creates yep. men, and it, what he creates gets better and better and better and better, yeah. and then he creates Eve, yeah. right? And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. And it is a putting up on a pedestal of, right, putting femininity up here, not saying, oh, you can't handle it because you're, you're the fairer sex, and that means that you're just like a little baby. No, that's not where, where it's coming from at all. Mm -hmm. And we have this culture that programs our women to be men. The feminist movement has become, let's make women men. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I talk a lot about media, just Hollywood -y stuff in class and just in general and strong women. You know, I'm thinking of strong characters that I've seen, like um, the, the French queen in Braveheart or, uh, mm. or princess or whatever she was. I mean, there's there's these great roles that are strong women that ha historically there have been these great strong women who are not strong because they can beat you in a fight. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing. I mean, we, I said this the other day. I told a, gr <laughs> I told a room full of junior girls the other day, uh, if all of you wait until I'm 60 <laughs> and then you all attack me all at once, I, I could probably kill all of you with my bare hands still. Like, I, I would. I'm not going to. I have no but desire I just to do need that. You to know but that just I so you know, I could. <laughs> yeah. I could absolutely do that. And it's ridiculous. Like, Women are, my wife is stronger than me in so many ways. Mm -hmm. None of them involve her ability to pick up heavy stuff. <laughs> and why, and I'm not talking about that. And I don't want to just dwell on the, the, the strength. And she thing, does CrossFit. But she does. She does. <laughs> uh, but the fact that what strong women are, according to our modern culture, is, is men. men. Which is, that's why I say all of these sexual sins seem to be a direct attack upon women. I mean, contraception hmm. is that. Let's let's like make that. you like mm -hmm. let's new to you with life uh, killing injections mm -hmm. and pills, um, and then let's pretend that you're just as promiscuous as men through pornography, and then look at these women's sports that now have these dudes who say they're women right. dominating them. Clearly, it's right. like if you want to be good, you've got to be a man. What if you want to be a woman? What does that look like? We look have look a at high the blessed Virgin Mary who beat Leah Thomas, the guy who says he's a girl who's swimming for UPenn. She, she there's a girl um, who beat him. No, no, no. Oh. So the guy, who's, Leah Thomas is his I, name. I haven't followed this. Right? Tell so, us. so there's a guy, Leah Thomas, right? He's a, he's a dude who says he's a girl, yeah. and now he's swimming for the, for the girl. He's breaking all these records, right? One of our high school boys, shout out to Grant Garcia, has been smashing his records, <laughs> like the Leah Thomas dude. Oh, good. Right? As a 16-year-old, 17-year-old junior in high school. Wow. Right? Uh, right. I see your point. So he looks... Great when he races against girls, but he wouldn't actually come in third place against yeah, the dudes. But I, I love what you said about it's really attack on it's an attack on femininity because it feels like an attack on masculinity, right? Hmm. All these things do, and 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 they know, are to some degree for sure. sure. Yeah, but but I really like that. I, I think I think that's a uh, that's something yeah. worth worth chewing on a little bit. Hmm. Can you 
how else? I'm curious. I don't mean I'm, to interview you, no, but I just I'm like, thinking I like of that What idea. are the different kind of like sexual sins? So we see fornication, all right? Mm-hmm. Like, so fornication is a cowardly act by which a man sort of imposes, you know, uh, his child upon someone he's then not willing to sure. stand by. <clears throat> so she takes the brunt of that, not him. Right. But then we say, but it's okay because I'll pay for you to pay someone to slaughter to our, our child. child. Right. Right. So that's an attack on motherhood. What else do we have? We have pornography, which is clearly um, an attack on women, principally. What else do we have? We have contraception, Mm -hmm. which is just a new to you, to make you like a man. Right. So that way you can get a job, and that job doesn't have to be impacted by your sexual promiscuousness. Well, the end-all be-all of being a woman now is don't have any babies and get a really high... Yeah, paying Scrape executive Clark position off someone's and teeth in a dentist's office. As, Congratulations, uh, you've made it. Anthony does. Yeah, but what else? Yeah, uh, transgenderism. I mean, I, again, uh, this is not meant to be like a bifurcation where it's like it's only an attack on women, not a man. Clearly, it's an attack on the human race. Um, but I think I think Satan principally hates women. I love what Louis de Montfort says of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He says that the devil fears the Blessed Virgin Mary right. even more than God Himself. And you, you read that and you're scandalized, awesome. right? right? You're like, well, why? And he says, not because the power and hatred of God are not infinitely superior to mm-hmm. that of the virgins, but because of his pride, he fears to be beaten by a little handmaid. That's you know? awesome. That's but, I mean, great. Yeah. You, you want to know what it means to be a woman? This is my body given up for you, right? And then we see that in, let it be done unto me is what I meant to say. Sure. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. This is my body given up for you. That's you know? beautiful. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it does seem like that. And even transgenderism stuff, it's just... I mean, I know you've got women pretending they're men and men pretending they're women, but this idea that we can just all pretend that men are now women, and we don't even know what women are. See, this is the thing. We've been talking about gender roles. I hate the word gender. We've been talking about roles, male, masculine, and feminine roles within marriage. The reason this is unpalatable to people in this society is because we don't know what a man is, what a woman is, what marriage is, Mm -hmm. What sex is for? Like, is it any why? It's the same thing with education. Like, if you don't know what a human is, you shouldn't be in the business of educating them. I find even amongst awesome, solid Catholic families that fathers in particular struggle in a real way to communicate this to their kids. Like, those truths. And not in a basic way. Like, I don't think there aren't very many dads out there who are uncomfortable saying, well, we don't believe in same-sex marriage Mm -hmm. or whatever. But I see again and again, especially as girls get older and they're looking to, they, they need a non-romantically interested, non-sexually threatening man in their life, right? To affirm them and remind them of their goodness. And I see that, I see us as fathers failing over and over again. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. And also something I always, anytime I talk on this, I want to say, my daughter is, my oldest daughter is seven. Right? I have a seven-year-old daughter, a six-year-old daughter, a th- four-year-old daughter. Yes. Um, so I've never raised teenagers but I interact with them constantly, right? I'm, I'm booked up. Every lunch I ever have, I've got somebody sitting in my office talking. And the, the thing that I hear over and over and over again from girls, great girls, good families, you know, they're going to daily mass and all of this stuff, they're father wounds. It always comes back to father wounds, all the time. I mean, hmm. it, and that, that scares the crap out of me hmm. as, as a father. I mean, girls who will say, um, my dad thinks I'm a slut. And I'll say, why? What does she mean by that? Why would you say that? You're cl- no, no, he doesn't, right? And everyone, you're, you're amazing. And I see you, you're wearing a freaking veil to mass on a Tuesday. <laughs> and you're just, you've got your crap why does together. She, why does this person say that? And they'll draw it back to some comment that was made forever ago about, I don't want you to ride in that car with that boy to that dance. Hmm. Or, and it's, but yeah, so, so much of this is not so much, but a lot of this is subjective. I mean, that man, let's say that's all that he said. I don't want you riding with that boy to that dance. Good. He should have said that. So sure, it, sure, it, sure, maybe sure. it's maybe he doesn't think that at all, and she's just received that. And it, no, what I, my point though is that it's not the comment, right? It's the oh. fact that the comment is coming from somebody oh. from this man who hasn't demonstrated his love and affection for her, hmm. right? In a way that, and what's, it is subjective, but mm. it doesn't matter. Who ca- who cares if you're correct on this? Mm. The issue is that your child feels that feels way. this has this wound that they'll carry forever. I mean, you can talk to grown women about this. I guarantee a lot of them have got serious wounds coming mm. from things that dad has said said when they were 14, 15 years old. Mm-hmm. And but, what, what's tough though as a parent is that absolutely will be the case with your kids and mine. 
Sure. Because there is an enemy of our souls who hates us intensely and wants to lie to us about who we are so that we'll believe things about ourselves that will lead us to hell. Sure. So it's like it's something even innocuous. Like, I don't want you to ride in the car with that boy. The devil can use that kind of thing. And I, I still think there's degrees, though. I think we were talking about this the other day, right? There's, I can't, no matter how good of a father I am, it doesn't matter if I'm the perfect father in every, in every way, right? My kids are going to have wounds. They're going to have problems. They're gonna, I'm never going to, like perfectly raise my kids mm -hmm. to prevent them from being fallen creatures with concupiscence, right, right? Right. But what I can do is fight like hell, because that's what we're fighting against, mm. right? To make sure my child has that understanding of self-worth, right? Mm. The number of girl guys too, but girls more commonly, who come to me and say, I'm a burden. Like, they'll tell me all their problems, right? They'll, they'll ball their eyes out in my office, right? Telling me all these things. And then, but what it really comes down to is, I don't want to tell anybody this because I feel like I'm a burden. And I feel mm -hmm. like I'm not worth talking. And I, what I say to him is, you are a burden. That's true. So am I, right? We're all burden. We, the, the point is, you need to be comfortable taking that burden and sharing it with somebody, right? And mm -hmm. saying like, listen, I, I, I'm going to burden you with this because I love you and I know you love me and I trust mm -hmm. you. And that's, that's what they need. I gave a blessing to a girl the other day, just a little quick. She asked me for one, right? Like I give to my daughters at night, right? It's this sort of, uh, God holds you and Mary keep you all the days of your life. You're a princess of heaven. You're a child of God. Your true home is in heaven. I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm so glad you're mine, right? And this girl just breaks down, mm -hmm. right? Bawling. And I'm, she, I'm like, what? what's going on? Why are, you, why are you doing that? And she says, I... I've never had a man say that. And it's not because I'm great for the record, mm. right? It's something that was really easy. It took me five seconds to do, but it's because there are these wounds mm. and these, I please somebody hear me and see me and love me. Mm. I feel the same way. Just so into the topic of raising kids in Sodom, what, what would your advice be to these fathers if they were open to listening to you? What, what are we going to be doing better? You have to, first of all, you're, you have to love your kids enough to make them hate you. What right? are you okay. I, I know, but I know what you mean by that, but I would love you to delve into yeah, that. You, uh, I think you have to do all the hard stuff that's going to make your kids upset, right? Be that a technology thing. I mean, that's old school, though. I mean, 95% yeah. of all the issues we have are directly tied to a phone. Yeah. yeah. School. I don't mean to brag about this, but I was telling parents not to give their smartphones before it was cool. Like 10 right. years ago. Oh, absolutely. That's all I've been doing. Traveling the country, telling parents not to give their children smartphones. That's I it. I hate them. That's the only thing I I've said. Mine. I'm addicted to mine. People pay money. I just give a oh. five second talk. <clears throat> right. But, Can you pass me those matches? Sure. But I think that's the, uh, I think that's one, right? And I think the other is you have to have, you have to get over the awkwardness. And I've been blessed can with I, a lack of awkwardness. Can I just cut you off real sure. quick? Because I have a lot of parents who are like, okay, fine, I don't give my smart, I give my a smartphone or something. But what do I do? I want to recommend um, another phone that we just got our son. It's called a Gab phone, G A B B. I think it's G A B B phone. Right. Um, it's created by these Mormons. You know, awesome. Love who, the Mormons. Which is the greatest. Yep. So I don't think Love they're the actually, Mormons. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. There's nothing about their religion that comes into this phone. But Mormons are just beautiful, family-loving, mm -hmm. family-encouraging people. Now, what's cool about the Gab phone is there's zero access to the internet, but you can send text messages, you can put music. It looks like a smartphone. It works like a smartphone. There's zero way to get it. Zero way to get... Um, can you check if there's maps on that? Neil? Oh, look, it's G-A-B-B. -B. G-A-B-B, -B. Yeah, yeah. Let's put a link in the description. Again, I'm not making a kickback from this. I just We just got that for Liam, because Liam, my eldest, just turned 14, and we gave him that phone... And so it's like he's got a gab phone, so he doesn't have to feel like he's got a flip phone, which is impossible to text on. He can send photos to his friends. He can take little videos and whatever. Um, zero access to the internet. But the other thing we tell him is, like, keep the phone downstairs every single night. Keep it charging. And he's such a good boy. He's done that every single can night. Can you see what he does on it? Can you read his text messages on it? I make sure. he. We have his passcode. Awesome. And he's never allowed and to not have it. he can't delete it? Uh, what do you mean? Can he change it? Can he delete text messages? He can delete text messages. Because I, I always yeah. tell parents, filtering software is great. It's never perfect, but yeah. it's great, right? I mean, I can, I guarantee you that if you've got your phone totally done up with everything, mm -hmm. I can probably get porn on it in like 45 seconds, yeah. right? Um, Here, I'll show you. Give yeah, it yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, cl close, up, close up on this phone, Neil. No, but filtering software is never enough. It, mirroring software is so important. Our kids, kids are dumb, man. It's kids are dumb. So are parents. Yeah. But I'll tell you one thing I've noticed, and this is uh, something I think I'm learning. I'm in a slightly different stage of life to you, you know, because my kids are older. Mm -hmm. one, one thing I didn't expect is the maturity and intelligence of my children as they grew. 
Sure. Maybe it's because I was encountering kids who were hooked on porn, and so I just thought, all oh, kids are stupid, it, you know, so don't ever give your kid a phone, whatever. But my kid's 14. Like, we've talked about pornography a great deal. We've talked about addiction. Talked, you know, we go to confession, you know, um, and, and I don't think he's ever seen pornography. I'd right. put money on that. Praise you know? God. Yeah, praise God indeed. But, um, but if he did, okay, go to confession. Like, but, but I guess what I didn't realize is that as my kids grow, they actually begin to understand your arguments and, and they see why it's a bad idea. So it's not like I'm just dealing with big children, you know, who are 15 years old but have the brain capacity of a 12-year-old or right. a 7-year-old. I mean, that might be the case. Different kids have different personalities. Some are more mature than others. But it's been really cool as my kids have been growing up to explain these things to them and to see them get it. You know? I, I agree with that, but I, I also think that it is so incredibly alluring. Indeed. It's it doesn't a, it's, matter I mean, if it's how, alluring to us as adults right. who only just got the internet five seconds ago, it's right. obviously going to be alluring to our kids. Yeah. No, but, and I'll also say, I'm, I'm sure you do a great job talking to your kids, but so many parents are uncomfortable doing that. So many parents it's, yeah, it's are uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Yeah. Or they're uncomfortable doing physical things, right? Like hugging and snuggling with their daughter after mm -hmm. she's gone through puberty. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden she's starting to look like a woman. And now, ooh, I feel icky when my daughter's walking yeah. around in her pajamas. Like, yeah. you got to get over that stuff. We were talking about that the other day, yeah. weren't we? Yeah. Yeah, you've got to know. Yeah. I don't care if it's weird. Get over yourself for your kid's sake. Yeah, someone said that to me because I mean, I got daughters who are like 12, you know, and a little younger. And <clears> gosh, I love them so much. I wrestle with them still. You know, it's like they, that's one of their favorite things to do is to wrestle with me. <laughs> and they're vicious. You know, funny about wrestling with kids is the dad's always like, no, you can't bite, and you can't, and no crotch shots, and you, you can't, and you're like, well, what, the kid is like this big, what <laughs> chance does he have if he can't do this? I, this, wa I watched Avila punch you in the face. Did she? At, after the, the little mixer the other night. Did you Remember? punch me in the face? Yeah, on the way out, you had her, and you're like, you can't get out of it, how can you get, and then she went, That's boom. right, she it did too. Great. spit all over the place. That's yeah. all right, I love that girl, so I love um, all my kids, they're so good. No, but that, those conversations, those open conversations i think goes so far i mean my kid's nine i started talking to him about porn when he was seven yeah in a, not in an explicit way no right um but and we talk about it fairly regularly it comes yeah. up and it's just kind of boy talk and i mean you can tell already there's a little bit of uh i don't really want to talk about this stuff we also have a farm so it's really easy to talk to kids about sex because it's like what are the goats doing are they giving each other piggyback ride? no <laughs> <laughs> what's it's a goatee back ride yeah, well, they're, that's, that's making how are they making babies. Well, you see that thing? It's penis. Oh, okay. And then yeah. it's going, oh, God, all right, great. Yeah. yeah do, you think that, do you think that is part of our awkwardness about sex? Is like maybe a lot of us grew up in rural communities back in the day and it was a lot more obvious and in your face. Oh, and, yeah. Totally. I mean, you think about when uh, these people who had nine kids and lived in a one room, you know, farmhouse somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of in your face, outside, inside, all, you know, those kids came from somewhere. Good point. Uh, now, now, for the record, my suggestion is not <laughs> have sex in the room <laughs> to with your children. Clear. I want to make that, yeah, yeah. really obvious. Uh, but no, I, and I don't know, I'm not sure why. I've always been blessed with, like, a, I'm, I'm super comfortable talking about it. I talk about, be it sex or social media or, mm. or whatever. I also think, and I'm going to make a lot of kids mad when I say this, I think we give our kids too much credit for their ability to navigate this world. Because we don't, ex we don't expect, for the past, what, 12,000 years of human civilization, things have been pretty pretty much the same, right? Mm. Industrial revolution happens, things get a little weird, we get less rural, we get more urban, and that's that changes some stuff up. And now we've got the universe at our hands all the time, and everybody's ideas coming for our kids. And at the same time, when we're living in luxury beyond what you know the emperors of Persia lived in, right? Mm. We lived. I've lived in a double wide trailer for the past six years on all this property. I still live. <laughs> you were richer than the Babylonian more, kings. Seriously, yeah. more opulently with my running water and mm. air conditioning and, and and whatever. And I don't know how humans fare in the. We know, none of us do. We can lie and talk about studies from the past 40 years or whatever, but no, that we're this is an experiment mm. in human societal evolution that we've never seen before, mm. and I don't think it's that great. I'm, mm. I'm not saying we ought to all be Luddites and go back out and live in caves, but I... We should consider it. <laughs> here, here's a controversial sentence. Okay. I read the Unabomber Manifesto, yeah. Ted Kaczynski. Okay, so Taliban. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, go. Yeah. He's bad. Bad guy. Bad guy. You, but, shouldn't, you shouldn't blow up people. Said a lot you of shouldn't great send things, mail though. bombs. He's right about pretty much everything, though, in the <laughs> Unabomber Manifesto, except the sending bombs to judges part. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. Uh, Maybe but, we could come up with an edited version where you just take out those bits and you, add them into a pe an appendix and then publish it. I think you should do Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to read that now. I, I watched great. the Netflix series. It was fantastic. No, it's a, it's that's the reason I don't too. stop at Red Lights. I watched that. Do you remember that bit? Uh -huh. How he talked about you come up, you drive, it's the middle of the night, there's no cars anywhere, you're at a red light, and you sit there. Why? 
because this thing is telling you to. Ted Kaczynski says that? Yeah, in well, the, it, yeah, yeah, in, in the Netflix. So I don't sit at red lights anymore. I drive through them at night time. That's beautiful. I look both ways. In yeah. Steubenville, the population used to be three or four times the amount it is now. We have an inordinate amount of red lights. <laughs> and there's like four cops in this town. Yeah, what so I've what are they going to do? For, you know? for being yeah, here. They're, yeah. they're busy with you know, meth busts and stuff. Yeah, no, I, I am really interested in a totally uh, almost... Sadistic's not the right word, but just sort of like watching a plane crash or something or a train accident kind of way about how we develop over the next couple of yeah. centuries. And I'm not optimistic. I don't feel great about it. No. But I also, this sounds catless, but I also don't care that much about the, the whole everything. I was talking to my dad the other day about the Ukraine, right? We were riding in the car and talking about, you know, Russians invading and all these bad things that could happen. And I said, at the end of the day, though, I, it's kind of like me and my kids and my wife and like we're together and they're safe and so mm, the outside world matters you know, though it, it it matters more than it should because of globalism and all that technological mm. interconnection that we're talking about but even um, just even just american society matters i mean i mean even just the way it's become perverted over the last however many years i mean that's obviously paying impacting your family and if well, that's america what I was becomes, say, it only matters in so far as it impacts my family is how i feel mm. and that's not a i don't know if that's the most um <laughs> prudent way to, well, yeah, way to say even that. appropriate way right, right like you saying, might you might say i wish i felt otherwise but here's how i feel i'm not saying that i hate the uh, i hate america and i'm rooting for its collapse or something like that yeah. but i am saying like my priorities are my soul my wife's soul my children's soul and then my slightly larger community of the saint john bosco people or whatever it is mm -hmm. their souls and then the sort of concentric circles get further and further out yeah yeah there, there is a sense of which isn't it where like uh modern technology like podcasts and news have forced us to care deeply about people sure. that we never encounter, which is fair and good, perhaps, where we don't know the people who live next door to us. Well, telescopic charity is something that's so interesting. Come into the mic a bit, yeah. Telescopic <laughs> charity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's something that's so interesting well, to me. I haven't heard about that. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I haven't term? heard that phrase, no. So, do you remember Coney 2012? Coney 2012, you remember no. that? So, in, uh, this was in 2012, there was this dictator in Africa named something coney right he was horrible he was terrible child soldiers and chopping off arms oh, yeah, and all yeah. that, I remember, awfulness, I recall that yeah. right and there was this big push coney 2012 and we all had to do something like we all had to collectively not like this guy hard enough or something <laughs> I, I don't remember and i gave a talk that year on telescopic charity huh. and this idea that we're, we're putting so much of our emotional energy in this yeah. thing that we are so disconnected from meanwhile there's people not well, your community. No, not just your community, community in your own household. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right? There's members of your own family that you need to reach out to, that you need to talk to. But it's so much easier. And I'm that way too. Like you want to give me let me give you an example of me being a coward, right? Hmm. I can I can talk about oh, that's, a noise. that's my silly phone, don't worry. I can talk about uh I can talk about the problems with society and the church and complain about German bishops or whatever all day long, but it's really uncomfortable for me to have a conversation at Thanksgiving dinner with my aunt or uncle or cousin or somebody who doesn't believe any of the things that i believe yeah. i'm called to that more than i'm called to stop warlords in africa yeah it's like it's it's uh, analogous or maybe it's the same thing as telescopic activism mm -hmm. like if i get outraged about global warming then i appear to be uh, someone very principled but right. nothing in my life needs to change right you know it's safer right? like if i if i knew that uh, these people who are big into you know combating so-called global warming or whatever we're doing away with their phones and things like that. Right. And living without cars. I'd be like, wow, okay. Sure. Let, let me hear what you got to say. But if you're living exactly the same as me, just so you can feel morally superior, it's a little more difficult to listen to you. Well, I've always said, you know, I, we do a lot of, we're weird. We do a lot of hunting and farming and we don't buy animal products. That's like our shtick, right? Um, I respect the vegans so much. I don't really want to talk to one, <laughs> but no, but I, but I respect them. You know, yeah, they, yeah. They're, they're doubling down. They're, they're, there's some philosophical integrity there. You yeah. Know? That's great. It's the same reason why I can respect a Bernie Sanders all day long. Like I truly believe he believes everything that he mm -hmm. said and he's willing to. Whereas what, Biden just seems like a puppet for whatever the left's having him right. say. Yeah. I don't even know if he knows what he believes. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that's uh, that the, drawing the line between you're wrong and I hate everything that you stand for, but I respect you. I think that's, I think that's interesting. Mm. Um, One of my favorite John Henry Spann, that's his name, by the way, listeners, uh, favorite John Henry Spann stories is I came over to your house just to visit you, have a beer or something, and you had a goat by the hind legs and right. asked me to put a rubber band around its scrotum. And is I'm, that how it went down? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm upset because what I wanted to do, I just <laughs> moved and so I couldn't find them. Yeah. But 
It was terrifying for me. A couple I was, of I'd weeks. never done anything like that. You're like, make sure both of the testes are in. Make sure both of the testes are in. Don't give the nipple. Don't ah, give the nipple, ah. too. No, but I wanted to bring you. I have, still have that? I have them, yeah. They're I would a, be honored if you sent me your It's in a jar full of these. salt. I wanted to drill a hole through them yeah. and put a little necklace, make a little necklace. I will wear and it, gift at it at least you. for an hour. Promise? At least, on yeah. the show? Will you do it on the show? Yeah. Okay. I'll do well, that. If you send it to me, I will. Yeah, I yeah. will. I'll, I'll dig through my stuff to find um, the good balls for you. Yeah. <laughs> I got your back, man. Tell us about hunting. Um, I don't know. You and I are going hunting in Africa this July. That's we be cool. are. Have you said Have you said anything about that on the I've show? I've said before? nothing about it, partly because I'm not a hunter. Yeah. I'm just going because you told me to. Like, no, All right. You got to go. It's going to be great. So we're going to Namibia, right? Just northwest of South Africa. Uh, and we're hunting what, Jim's buck, spring buck, warthog, impala. Red heart beast, wildebeest. That's what's sort of on the okay. on the menu. Uh, and I mean, I've I've been hunting. I'm a late onset hunter, so I started hunting when I was in my early twenties, uh, and I love it. I mean, we eat it all, right? We get all of our. I mean, there's all these there's all these rumors I can dispel about hunting that drives me crazy, right? About like there's the way the seasons are are established. You're never killing Bambi's mother, right? Mm -hmm. Bambi is old enough to take to take care of himself by the time you're allowed to go hunting, yeah. right? By the time the season starts. Uh, but yeah, we've been doing it for, I kill probably 40 a year, fill up our so good. and that's, and it's great for the kids. Right? Yeah. I gotta say, I mean, this was so cool. Um, I don't know if I told you this, Neil, my son went hunting for the first time he with you. One. Right. Yeah. It was great. We went to your parents' cabin. Um, you showed him how to shoot a crossbow, crossbow, compound bow, mm -hmm. crossbow. And, uh, yeah, we went inside and you went through a thousand pictures of deer. Where do you shoot it? 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 And then you were telling us, like, don't get your hopes up. We may not get a deer. So we woke up about 6 a.m. We, uh, we went and sat in your blinds and we, we prayed the rosary, like, mm -hmm. really, really quietly. And then some deer came out and Liam shot it. it and wild. it was amazing. I mean, I've never experienced anything like that. My favorite part of that was you crawling on all fours in the woods, licking the blood off leaves to make sure, yeah, that's blood. Make sure it's blood and not, yeah. That was great. Yeah, good. And then and he found it. We butchered it well, and painted so his cool face too, with blood. I love this. Because when you bow hunt, a lot of times they make it a ways off, right? They don't fall yeah. right in front of you. And that happens sometimes with guns too, depending on your on your shot. But it made it a long way. So you get the drama and suspense of, we went, are we going to we find this? We looking for that thing, man. Down those ravines. Yeah. And, and then he had just run across the road and... And died, yeah. And we pretended like we didn't find it, so we could. That's so the boys right. Track yeah, it down. That, that was, was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. All right. So, what's what's what do you think are some common objections to hunting, and what's your response to them? I mean, there's probably some silly objections, which you're welcome to go through, but then some more serious ones. No, uh, one of the one of the better ones that I've heard is it is uh, you're you're working against evolution, right? Because I I trophy hunt. Right, and that's a bad word. People, you say you trophy hunt, and everybody's like, "Oh, that's terrible." Like, no, no, no I totally trophy hunt. Right, I'm gonna eat everything I kill every single time. Right, always. We eat everything. We get the bones for the dogs at the end. Mm. I just got freezer uh, heart hearts in my freezer, deer liver in my freezer, and all that stuff. But there is a there. There's this idea that oh, you're hunting these big mature deer. Like you're you're killing the biggest and strongest and best. And yeah, I am. You're right. And it's mostly because their antlers look cool. Right. It's also because they're a lot bigger and there's a lot more meat on them. But the objection is, and I think this makes a lot of sense, is no, I'm I'm hunting the deer who have had years to get their genetics out there, right? They're breeding all these doe. There's a lot of them, right? Good on him. He's now <laughs> he's made it to five years old. He's big. He's beautiful. He's a 12 point that scores 150 inches. He's a great giant deer. And now I'm putting him down. Um, that's the only one that I think holds ground. I think a lot of the other ones are from emotion, right? And what it's do they sad. sound like? It's, it's sad. sad. You yeah. shouldn't hurt I mean, you animals. Shouldn't go get your meat from the grocery store like normal people. Right. Yeah. And we we started doing it, like I said, later in life, mostly because I have a like I'm a I'm big into conservation. I donate a lot of money to conservation organizations. I think that's super important. Uh, but I want my animals to be I want to be a good steward of God's creation. Right. So our animals, right, be it a deer in the woods that I'm hunting and I, I, I kill and drag out of the woods to move to my freezer or the chickens that we run in the backyard. They live long, happy lives. Really bad five seconds mm -hmm. at, the, at the very end, and then it's, then it's done. And talking about kids, right? Talking about kids in our broken, awful world, it connects you with a nature that you're already connected to. Hiking is great, camping is great, kayak trips are great, right? And you're experiencing nature, but you're not really participating in it. And we do participate in nature, like all the time. We are currently in nature. This is nature. Just because there's lights, just because there's AC. 
Just because we're talking through whatever highly this thing is. technological whatever. <laughs> what? Just whatever this thing is. is right. At some point you don't understand it, right? It's right. Like, but, some magic. But we are nature. Nature is us, right? We are part okay. of God's creation. And I think that's really good for kids to understand, right? You are eating because this thing died that you went out and killed. And now we're going to take it back to that. We don't do a processor. We do it all in the backyard. My son stands out there in the freezing cold with me. or butchering deer and I'm handing him organs and, and all this stuff. And then it moves to, and my wife loves this, to our dining room table. <laughs> Once I get it quartered out, right? Yeah, yeah. I cover it with plastic sheeting. And we or, did this at my house, if you remember. We butchered yeah. that deer. There's yeah. blood everywhere here. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I mean, it really is this, it's this no, beautiful No, I, I remember thing. taking my son to your house because you were going to butcher, well, butcher some chickens. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I loved it because you sat there and you, you, you spoke about how they had a great life and we're not mean to animals. We, we don't want them to suffer. Right. I mean, that was, that was a really beautiful teaching lesson. I sing I think, John for Denver to them right before I <laughs> break their necks. Yeah, they all, every chicken I've ever killed gets the chorus of Country Roads and gets its neck snapped on the high country. Snap. Nice. It was dead. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think that participating in that is a, it's a big deal. Yeah. And we need that. Um, yeah. I view it. Let me tell, can I tell a story real quick? Oh, you can about tell hunting? all the stories. About hunting? So I was hunting on an island off the coast of Georgia called Asaba Island, right? It's a lottery system. You get drawn. Nobody lives out there. It's 27,000 acres. Mm. It's beautiful. Mm. But it's jungle, man. I mean, it's jungle. So I'm out there with another, I don't know, 50 people or so. And I had three days on the island. And there's one road that runs up the center of the island. And the Department of Natural Resources, right, DNR, drives a truck and you can sit in the back of the truck and jump out and you've got an allotment on that island. So hundreds of acres allotment and you get off and you walk into the woods and you shoot stuff and you have to drag it back to the road and then they'll give you a ride back at the end of the day. Right. So just back and forth. They sort of run this trolley, uh, this, this truck. And so the first day goes and I get out in the woods. It's cool, man. I, I saw, a, um, uh, I saw an alligator that was about 10 feet long. It was really cool. I uh, shot a deer, shot a wild hog. And another time, talking about being an idiot in nature, I'm walking around. I see all these little alligators, baby alligators, like, you know, hmm. foot long. And I'm just, you know, it's like, I'm going to film all this, whatever. <laughs> and I hear this noise, and I look up, and on this rise is mama alligator. Because I wasn't thinking reptiles hang out with each other, you know, <laughs> which is my, my own ignorance. And mama is up there and she's huge. She's enormous. She's got her mouth open like she was sunning. I mean, it's just like backlit by the rising sun, terrifying. Mama <laughs> snaps her jaws, starts whipping her tail back and forth and jumps into this like marshy area. I mean, 50 feet from where I'm standing. And I think she was trying to scare me away from that part of the island. And it worked. And it worked really <laughs> well. <laughs> really great. That was her part. Um, so anyway, the first day goes by, I kill a deer. Right? I get back, and I'm outside my tent, and I'm yeah. cleaning this hog, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, hogs are gross, and yeah. they stink, and whatever. And, I, and this woman walks up, right? And she's got her brand new hunting jacket on, and her fancy hunting boots on, and all this stuff. And she's, like, looking at me, and she's filming me with her phone. And there were, there were two girls on the island, right? One was this woman. And the other was this 12-year-old who was like Katniss Everdeen, man. She was legless. Just, she'd knock him down. She's out there with her dad. It was really cool. Awesome. And I said to this woman, are, are you hunting? Right? Are, you, are you out here to hunt? She's like, yeah. Yeah, I'm here to hunt. And once again, brand new boots, brand new jacket. Clearly, she's there to, to hunt like you would hike. You know, like just yeah. let's enjoy nature and be out in it. So the next day, she's on my truck. They drive us out. It's her and I think her boyfriend, right? And they get dropped off. And then I get dropped off, and midday comes around, nighttime comes around, and the truck comes back to pick us up. So they dropped her off before me, so I get picked up before her, right? Uh -huh. And so we get to her spot where she and her boyfriend are supposed to be, and they're not there. The DNR guy, honking the horn, got a spotlight out, hollering. And finally, after about 20 minutes, he goes, all right, I got to go get somebody. And we all drive back to camp. DNR officer, more DNR officers get in the truck. They bring in people from the mainland, right? They have a DNR boat that comes out there, and all these guys get off, and they look for this woman for hours and hours and hours, and they can't find her. And I mean, there's a, there's big pigs, right? There's 300 pound razorback boars with freaking steak cutter tusks and all this stuff out there, and then there's these alligators all over the place, and like I think she's dead. Like yeah. I'm thinking, homegirl is in the belly of some. <laughs> prehistoric aquatic you know dinosaur out there somewhere and eventually after hours and hours and all these people they find her it turns out those brand new boots had given her horrible blisters and she'd gotten lost and you can't take off your boots i mean there's snakes everywhere and uh, brambles and saw grass it's just an unpleasant place to be if you don't have good good clothes on yeah right and 
they found her eventually. She comes back crying, gets on a boat, going back to the mainland, and I'm I kind of enjoyed it, sitting around my campfire just watching this drama unfold, mm-hmm. and she's okay. I felt so bad for the boyfriend because that's what hell is like, right? You're with your girlfriend, lost in the jungle, <laughs> and she has brand new boots on, so she can't walk, <laughs> right? And I like that as an example of participating in versus just seeing nature, right? Experiencing versus participating in nature. She was there to experience and walk around like she would for a hike and was reminded really quickly, like, oh, I'm not separate from nature. I'm here. Nature can kill me. Nature is beautiful and powerful and good. It's God's creation, right? But it'll kill you dead. Mm. And that's that's cool. And it is analogous to all of us, right? Like like right now in our modern society with all of our comforts and everything, it doesn't always feel like sin is real and hell is real and what because I'm comfortable and I'm happy. That's a really right? great analogy. I don't feel that way often. Yeah. But it still is. No matter how insulated I am, whether I believe in it or not, that's true. Right? And I am I am bound by the moral laws of God, whether I want to be or feel like I am, right? Feelings versus reality. So Gee, fun. that's a really that's a really good point. And I wonder how deeper into the matrix this metaverse is going to send us mm, mm. such that we're all the more isolated from reality and therefore God. Right. Mm. Right. No, it's it's terrifying. Did you see the commercial? The Super Bowl commercial? No. What, what happened? With the metaverse? No. The Chuck E. Cheese is the creepiest thing I've ever seen. Never it seen like, it. What was it? It's like the Chuck E. Cheese like animatronic animal band animals, right? Yeah. And they got decommissioned and the place closes down and you're following this one weird mouse looking monster thing. Uh, through all these places of thrift store and eventually being thrown away on the side of the road, right? Just living this miserable existence, right? And then somebody finds it, and they put the VR headset on it. And now it's in this happy land with all of its friends from before and whatever. Oh, I mean, it's, my gosh. It's same. It wasn't I mean, meant to be ironic. What I, no, no, no. What I took away from it is, hey, reality's terrible. It sucks. You should retreat from that and hide from it and never actually participate in the real world. Mm-hmm. Gross. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Um, so, what, what, I mean, there's got to be some people who are like, yeah, you have two white guys in Africa killing their animals. Mm. Like, this is exploitative. This is awful for those people who live there. Yeah, yeah. no, great. Um, not great, what you just said. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> Matt, can I see uh, the matches? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah let, me, let me light it and I'll throw them to you. If that's all right, yeah. So, we're going, to, we're going to Namibia, and I looked at a couple of them, right? I looked at Zimbabwe. and what, By the way, I've really enjoyed your role in this whole planning process. <laughs> I've done nothing. Where I just text you occasionally and say, you need to book this flight. Now. You need to be, yeah, you, you have to go. Oh. I'm afraid I'm going to be yeah. like that girl with the boots. No, you're going to be great. Just make sure your boots are worn in a little bit. Uh, but where we, well, why we chose Namibia as opposed to Zimbabwe or South Africa or any of those places is I was looking at like, you can look up like corruption indexes and things. And the North American hunting model, right? North American conservation model that's involved hunting, right? Uh, is very different than what they do in Africa. Here's how it works in Africa. In Africa, let's say me and you are, we're, we live in Namibia, right? We're Namibian guys. And right. It's mostly desert. It's like a, like a high plains, sort of like South Dakota Badlands, but less hilly kind of mm-hmm. area. Scrub grass all over the place. And we, we eke out a living why, by raising cattle, or we've got a really small farm, or whatever. And all those animals, we hate them, right? The 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 antelope of various species and whatever they graze on the same grassland as our cows, yep. right? And they uh, they break through our fences sometimes and eat the crops that we're trying to grow to feed our families. And so the whole African model is to of conservation is to convince the locals not to just murder everything. I see. Not to just kill all the stuff. And the way they do that is they say, "All right, guys, great news." You're not going to kill any of these animals. And, yeah, they're going to eat some of your cow's grass. And they're going to break into your farm sometimes and eat some of your stuff. But white dudes are going to come over here from Steubenville, Ohio, right? And they're going to kill those animals. You're going to get money when they kill those animals, right? So those animals are now a resource that benefits you, Namibian fellow, right? And you're still going to get the meat from those animals to feed your family. So we're only allowed to eat as much as we can eat while we're there. Hmm. So we'll eat you know, 10 pounds in a week and a half or whatever, right. and then be done. And then the rest of it goes to the local villages. And that's how their whole model works. It's really cool. Mm. It's illegal for us to import anything. Mm. Yeah, cool. We can I, import antlers and I, I, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be a blast. You know, it's funny. You're such a good, you're one of the best storytellers I've ever encountered. I don't know. I'm trying, there's a million stories you've told me, and most of them are inappropriate for this show. You want to hear my favorite story? Yes. 
It's got nothing to do with anything. That but I, I want you to be able to tell beneficial. it like there's no cameras. If that's okay. not possible, don't do it. I think I can. All right. All right. So the year was 2008. All right. Right? I'm, I'm minding my own business. Minding your own business. In college. Yeah. With a group of a group of friends. Uh -huh. Right? Probably like praying a rosary or something. You know, just all American guys. Um, and I was definitely not praying a rosary. Right? This was like early, like I'm starting to convert time. Right? And we're walking to, we want to go play football, right? We're trying to go play football. If any of my kids are listening, they will know this story. Uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite stories. That has no, there's no benefit at all to the kids in me telling this story. It just shows what a, what a loser I was. And so we want to go play football, and we walk outside, and there's, we had a lot of Mexican nationals at my school. Like, they were mm -hmm. actual Mexicans. When I say Mexicans, it's not a pejorative. I'm saying they're actually from Mexico, mm -hmm. right? So there's all these Mexicans out there, and they're playing football, right? They're playing soccer. And we walk over, and we say, hey, guys. Do y'all want to go play football with us? Uh -huh. And it was just me and three of my friends, right? One was a really big guy. Looks like, I'll call him Ivan. Looks like Ivan Drago from Rocky Four, Big, blonde, muscly guy. <laughs> um, and then two other guys who were just like, they're guys, right? They're like me. And we, so you guys want to go play football with us? And these Mexican fellow says, uh, okay, but first you play with us, right? Uh -huh. I've got a terrible accent, but I'm going to do it anyway. It helps. Us. <laughs> you, play, you play soccer, then we go play football. Uh, we say, okay, cool. So I've never played soccer in my life. <laughs> like, I, I played soccer when I was five. I was a goalie in kindergarten, right? So I like played with blades of grass and yeah. tore the legs off bugs or something <laughs> while, everybody, while the ball was being chased around by this mom of kids. And so we say, fine, yeah, how, how hard can it be? Right, knowing we're going to get killed. So they say, okay, first to five, first to five. 37 seconds later, it's 5 0, right? We're crushed. They oh, they crushed you guys. Yeah, yeah. They creamed us. It was embarrassing, right? So we say, all right. Football, because they're they were a smaller set of people, right? They were little guys, right? So let's go play like football, football americano. Boom, we're gonna hit them. We're gonna do like we're gonna win now. They go okay, um, uh, five more, five more. I said no, nah, we're not gonna do five more. I go oh, cuatro us maybe. Uh, we say all right, fine, four more. Boom, 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 boom. Thirty seconds go by. Now we're down nine, right? Nine zero. We're like all right, football. Like ah, um, <laughs> tres más, tres más. Oh, boom, 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 boom. We're down, whatever, I'm not doing the math, right? Another three, then dos mas, okay? Uh, and so it's just, we're just getting creamed. They're amazing. They're so fast. They're everywhere. <laughs> all over the in place. In front and behind me yeah. at once. And so we're, we're getting destroyed, and finally they say, uno mas? And we say, all right, but here's the deal. One more. <laughs> right now the score's reset, 0-0. Zero, zero. Whoever wins this, wins. Whoever wins this, wins the game, and it's done. Right, and they go, okay, we start playing. Now, I'm going to tell you how it happened. Like, everything I'm about to say is true, right? It's going to sound like I'm making it up. It's, I'm not. We start playing. Ivan, big guy, mm -hmm. gets this ball. <laughs> Chariots of Fire starts playing from the sky, <laughs> right? Da 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 da. He's like moving. Da 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 da. We don't know the rules. Like, call your own foul, street ball, right? Elbows in the face. Da 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 da. Da. It's like over his head. Da 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 da. He gets it. He's so moving. Da 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 da. And he kicks this ball. Which catches on fire as it's shoo, flying, right? Through the goal. There's all these like seven guys just like na, da, na, 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 na. and it goes into the goal, burns a hole on the back of the net. Da, 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 na, 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 right? And I am so pumped. We're we're acting like we just won the Super Bowl. For the record, we are losing like twenty seven to zero. But we reset the score and we got that one. And the deal we made was we win the game. Yeah. Right? So we are jumping. I mean, it's like that scene at the end of uh, Miracle, you know, that Kirk yeah. Douglas movie. We're just like all over each other, high fiving. And things get heated you know, a little bit, right? Like, not bad, but like, we're better than you at your own stupid sport. And yeah, soccer's yeah. for women and children. And it's like getting like that. And there's a, there's a group of them, but there's one guy in particular who comes up, and his name, we'll call him Saul, because that was his name. Um, and he, he's, a, he's a big dude. He's a big guy. Curly hair, kind of just this big, tough, shirtless guy standing there. He's taller than I am. Um, and he's kind of in my face, and I'm kind of in his face. And it starts with... Your sport sucks and we beat you, and it becomes like your country sucks, <laughs> and then it's like your sister's a prostitute, and it devolves, right? It all just uh -huh. falls apart in ribbons as we're just in each other's <laughs> face, screaming back and forth, right? And I remember the crowd behind him was at first just so the this guys is, we were playing. Just with. to be clear, this is not him and Ivan, this is him and you. Him and me. 
right? So we're face to face about this far apart, right? And there's maybe eight guys behind him, right? And as we're yelling, more people start to show up behind him. And my wife says that this is not true, but she wasn't there. So, so what does she, she know? know. Yeah. I think, like, I remember people climbing down from trees that they had never <laughs> climbed up. I remember cars pulling up and just, like, 30 guys getting out of, like, a two-seater. Uh -huh, right? machetes. I remember, like, manhole covers being removed. <laughs> and my thought process in my head, and people just crawling out from the streets... Go, it starts with like, we can take them. There's more of them, but it's me and it's my broskies, man. We yeah. got this. Right, guys? Right, guys? And then more guys come, and it, and it becomes like, uh, all right, it's going to be a fair fight. Good. <laughs> Freaking Ivan, man, he's good for <laughs> 10 of these dudes. I can handle a few. My other guy <laughs> got this. And then it becomes <laughs> like, we're going we're gonna to lose. We're going to lose, but it's going to be cool. Like, we're going to go back to our dorm, like, put steak on our face and laugh about how we went down in flames. And then it's like, we're going to die. We're going to die together. Band of Brothers style, we're all dead. And I look behind me, and all my friends are gone. So it's me, and stretching out over the horizon is this sea of angry soccer players, angry Mexican soccer, as far as the eye can see. Coming to a point with Saul, <laughs> standing nose to nose with me. Yeah. And I was going to die, but I wasn't going to go away, right? This is a problem. I struggle with pride. That uh -huh. is a root sin, a major <laughs> sin that I struggle with. So I'm ready. And I'm done, and I'm accepting this, and thinking about how upset my mom's going to be, and all this stuff. And just then, from across the parking lot, a dorm room door opens, and Saul, his girlfriend, now wife, they got married, we reconciled years later, okay. comes running out. And the way I remember it, <laughs> she was wearing one of those like mid 1800s dresses that you see in like uh, Fistful of Dollars or Clint Eastwood movies that uh -huh. the Hispanic women yeah. wear. You know, like the shoulders are exposed, yeah. like a floral pattern. She's running, the dress is streaming behind her, and rose petals are flying behind wow. her. And she lays at Saul's feet and she goes, Saul, no! No, Saul, no, don't do this again. And I'm like, oh, okay, again, yeah. right. Good. No, please leave him alone. So we'll spare him. Spare him. And I'm just watching this happen right in front of me. And Saul kind of gives me like a you're not worth it. And he walks away. And the whole crowd dissipates. And me standing now in an empty parking lot as these heads of, I'll just go in all, every direction. I say something obnoxious like, you're lucky your girlfriend showed up or whatever. And that's a story about how I, I beat Mexico and defended America's honor in a <laughs> soccer game. And then what did he do? I, I don't know. I he walked, him. he kept walking away? He kept walking away. I Amazing. talked to him years later yeah, at church. I was like, I'm sorry about that. Like, I'm, I can be really, you know, asshole -ish. And what did you say to your friends who ran away? I was very upset. <laughs> I was very, I've so, never spoken to them since. So, well, well, that's actually a great point because <laughs> when I when I stopped, I sort of stopped being friends with them, actually. Like, it, it sort of fell apart over mm. the course of the next, I don't know, six months or whatever. Um, and I got a new group of friends. And if I can just talk a little bit about something more serious that I think is, is pertinent, right? Um, when I was in high school, I was, a, I was a fairly popular guy. I got invited to parties. I made all sorts of terrible decisions, right? And I uh, <laughs> didn't treat myself with respect. And I didn't treat girls with respect and whatever. But mm. I, I did what you did, right? What everybody was doing. And uh, I was always a nice guy. Moms always liked me. Meanwhile, I was just a garbage person, mm -hmm. right? Who was looking at porn and who was, um, you know, not not treating girls well and you know running around on the girls that I was dating, like hard, just horrible, mm -hmm. heartbreaking thing. I'm so embarrassed and ashamed of. But I didn't think it was bad at all, right? Because I didn't have any, I didn't have any real faith, right? My my, my family was. Um, my mother, she would tell you that she's Methodist, right? Um, she, that she doesn't go to church typically. Once again, wonderful woman, love her to death, mm -hmm. right? And my father was nominally Catholic. Um, he would like play guitar in the church choir or whatever, but it was just very milk toast, sort of nothing Catholicism down there. Lots of be nice to each other. And I didn't have an identity and I didn't have a culture, just something that I keep coming back to. Um, I was just sort of being blown along by, by the wind with everybody else. And for whatever reason, well, I, I think I can tell you the reason. When I was when I was 14 years old, I I didn't steal it. I, I really didn't. I borrowed it. I <laughs> borrowed my girlfriend's mother's car. Okay. Um, to go hang out with my girlfriend and sort of disappear with her for a little while. And while we were driving, it was about two o'clock in the morning. We couldn't figure out how to turn the headlights on, which was fine. <laughs> it was a full moon. Right? It was all yeah. good. We could see. But the America's <clears throat> Police Department, that's where I grew up, saw us and pulled us over. And we, we gave them a little, you know, a couple red lights, a couple stop signs, trying to get away. And then they, they, they get us. And I end up being 
like thrown into a holding cell. My mother comes to get me very upset. Or my dad came to get me very upset. Um, and to this day, that was the best decision I ever made. Now, let me, let me talk about that mm. a little bit. I'm so glad I did that. I'm so thankful. Praise be to God and his angels and his saints for me saying, you know what would be a great idea? Stealing your mom's purple uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee and going for a joyride, going to hang out. Because it lit a match under my parents of, we got to get you out of here. we got to get you away from the people that you're hanging out with. Right? we, we got to run. And so they sent me to a school a long way away, an hour away, down in Albany, Georgia. And I had a college professor there as a teacher my sophomore year in an ethics class, a nothing class, right? Just a <clears throat> throwaway elective. I was a sophomore, so I got bottom of the barrel elective picks class. And his name was Dr. Travis Campbell. He's a Presbyterian minister and a PhD in, I assume, theology. And his class... The first lesson he did, and I, I, this is my first lesson, every class, regardless of what I'm teaching right now, was he explained the difference between objectivism and relativism, mm -hmm. right? He said, truth exists. And it sounds so weird to say that now. Mm -hmm. It seems so stupid, right? Like, obviously, truth exists. But no, 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 that was news to me. Mm -hmm. I was so... Coming a little bit. I was so intrigued mm -hmm. by this idea that, that there, there was truth and things could be right. And, and by that, that meant if I said, I believe X... It means Y is wrong, mm. right? If I'm saying that this is true, Catholicism is true, what I'm saying is Presbyterianism or Islam or Judaism, it's not true, mm -hmm. right? Aspects can be true, right? Right, But I'm saying that this is, that this is right. And yeah. By definition, other things are wrong. And that blew my mind as a 15-year-old. And that started what would become eventually my conversion, right, over the course of the next four years or whatever of my life. And what made it worse was that, and I, I joke with the kids about this at school a lot, by, by being formed well, it makes life really frustrating. Because all it did was make me culpable for all my sins. I didn't change anything. <laughs> I was just culpable for them. Well, that's now. why it was frustrating. Right? And so I got into that. He eventually got me to thinking, okay, there's some of this whole Christianity thing. I called myself like a deist. I was like super edgy. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm cool and dangerous and interesting. And I wear black. Meanwhile, I'm like, you know, five foot nine and weigh 120 pounds. Looking at pornography. Just a loser. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Masturbating in a bathroom at the house. Like, bro, what? <laughs> Pathetic. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. And so, uh, so I, so I had this, uh, so I had this interest in Christianity. I like to read. I always like to read the on. And so I'm reading history books. And you're reading the early church fathers, and you can't read the early church fathers and not come away with, oh, there's something to this whole Catholicism thing. Mm. Uh, Polycarp, whose feast day was recently, right, he was huge because he knew John, right? Mm -hmm. John was his teacher. He was mm -hmm. a disciple of John. And Polycarp is talking about the sacraments and about the true presence and about all of these things the exact same way that the church is talking, right? Mm -hmm. And that was interesting to me. But the one that, as a 15, 16-year-old kid, was so intriguing to me, the one teaching that the church had that I thought was so interesting, right, was birth control. And this is why. I thought, what a stupid thing to take a stand on, Catholics. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Everybody's on birth control. Everyone I knew was on birth control, literally, I think. And these were girls who were being, <laughs> I was on birth control. My dog was on birth control. Uh, no, but it was, you know, everybody. Because, yeah. you know, they regulate a cycle when they were 11 or something. Yeah, uh, or they had acne or what. Everybody yeah, was on birth yeah, control. Yeah. And the fact that the Catholic Church was still saying, no, contraception is a sin, was so stupid to me. But it, became, it went from being stupid to being interesting because why wouldn't they change this teaching that they've had forever? Because everybody's doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And so that made me think, okay, I'm going to look into these, these Catholics, right? And I really didn't want them to be right because my family was vaguely nominally Catholic at the time, like mm -hmm. my extended family and everything. Um, and that would be really frustrating, you know, for them to be right about stuff. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I go, through, uh, I go through high school. I have this conversion sort of, right? And I ended up going to this little bitty school in the mountains of North Georgia because I got this random postcard at one point that had a picture of John Paul II on it. And there was some great quote about philosophy. I don't remember what it was. I wish I'd saved this card. That is one of my, I would pay thousands of dollars to still have this postcard because my life was changed. Mm. My soul, I think, hopefully, right, will be saved, right, because of this postcard that came. It was a Holy Spirit thing all day long. Mm. I have no idea how I got it. I didn't check I was Catholic on anything. I wasn't, but, but somehow I got this little card in the mail. And this podunk nothing school with 120 kids up in North Georgia, I, I read about them online, all this philosophy and theology stuff. And that's what I was interested in, the philosophy of 
everything, right? Because I had this cool professor and truth exists, so I should learn about it. And I ended up going to this school and my freshman year, I distinctly remember getting in all kinds of trouble, doing all kinds of stupid things. I had three rules. I had three rules added in the handbook. I'm proud of that. Uh, there's a no window display rule because it's something I put up in my window. There was a uh, <laughs> there was a no unauthorized vehicles rule because I bought this killer go kart from the pawn shop and used to drive. There was a no live Christmas tree rule because we cut down a pine tree <laughs> and drove it in our dorm room and decorated it. It was awesome. Uh, but I remember fresh maybe it was sophomore year. We were at a party, just kegger, big party, college party. It was so much fun. It was a blast. We're smoking and drinking and partying it up. And my buddy, John Power, yeah. who coincidentally your wife had in youth ministry. Isn't that crazy? In Houston, yeah. Texas, right? Um, it was like 1030 or 11. And he walked around the house. And I think he had a cowbell. He's ringing the cowbell. And he said, boys club, boys club, girls got to go. Like, just like that. Just a stupid, funny, whatever. Yeah. I'm sitting in a hot tub. <laughs> half drunk, right, chain smoking, like, what are you doing? You're ruining my life right now. Oh, the only reason I'm here is for these girls, yeah. right? And he ended up coming and sitting in the hot tub afterwards, and we spent the rest of the night drinking beer, and I said, like, why would you do this? He said, well, there's alcohol around, and I don't want somebody to do something they're going to regret, and we got we got to be smart about this. What a and man. then he and another group of guys there would say things to me like, hey, are you struggling with porn? I bet you are. Everybody is. You look like you are. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. yeah. So and so is, and so and so said that this this last week, and whatever. Yeah. And it became this real intimate that where I realized, oh, you're the first. You're friends. I've never had friends before, and you're actually friends. They I, care about I, you. I had a ton of friends. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And we used each other for yeah, yeah. getting girls or for you know getting drunk, sneaking or alcohol or or whatever. But they were actually for who actually loved me. Right, and it's the first time I ever felt loved by somebody who wasn't my parents, like in a real, mm. a real way. And I still didn't get it totally, but it was huge. And that's what I feel. I, I'm always on that with these kids at school. I don't know if I told you this or not, but when I was living in Ireland with my wife back in 2008, uh, nine, ten. Mm -hmm. He, it's uh, oh yeah. I love this is great. We, we really right. got to invest in more matches. We're paying three thousand dollars for a new camera, <laughs> can't afford the matches. Um, do you know that John Powers came and visited us in Ireland he in about two thousand and ten? He did a year there, didn't he? Like a coworker year? Or I don't know, but I remember him saying he was from Southern. Oh. What is what was the name of your college? Southern Catholic. Southern college. Catholic mm -hmm. College. So it's crazy that he, you know, if I that he knew you back then, I didn't know who you were. And Who's I remember he was saying that a professor told him that he should. Um, he decided he was going to pray a rosary for every day in his life up to his conversion. Um, so he was praying multiple rosaries a day just so he could catch up for every day. I just thought, wow, that's really cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very John Power thing to do. And he was, and like he's all such these a, guys, yeah. he's he was such a, a man. masculine guy. He was a man. These yeah. were all men, right? These were cool guys. We did dumb stuff. We did, well, I mean, um, I have one friend, I won't say his name, but at my 21st birthday party, on our. <laughs> All right, I'm going to tell the story. On our way back to our the extended stay hotel that I lived in with my friends uh, after our college closed down, because mm. Catholic doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but he took off all of his clothes in the back seat of the car, and as soon as he, we got there, he jumps out butt naked <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning and starts running laps <laughs> around the whole place. Nice. And we thought. Oh no, we're gonna get in all this trouble. And so we went to the landlord the next day and said, "Hey, just so you know, some guy was running around <laughs> naked." And he goes, "Oh, really?" And he goes, he pulls the video up. And he's like, "Um, is it is it that guy?" And like clearly, there's a guy running around naked. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's him. He goes, "All right, so let me rewind this a little bit." And it's, th that guy who got out of the car with you guys, yeah, that guy who then went into your room at the end of the night and stayed there until this morning, yeah. Yeah, that's like, him. Uh, but anyway, so what I'm saying is, these were stupid guys who did yeah. regular things. Yeah. It was, a, and, and not saying that's a regular, <laughs> a regular thing, thing. <laughs> but we did fun stuff, we yeah. did dumb stuff, and but there was this, there was this sense of like, oh, I love you, and I'm worried about your soul. And I say that a lot to the kids. I say that to my own kids as well as the kids at school. I don't care that much about your physical safety. I don't care that much about your physical well-being. I care a whole lot about your soul, mm. right? I care about you as a human being. I care about your salvation. I care about your virtue. I'm not worried about a lot of the other stuff. Yeah. No, those things you shouldn't do. I told a group of kids the other day that, um, you know, if I, if I catch you smoking cigarettes by the dumpster or something, okay, like, right, whatever. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. say, stop. You're, that's not okay. It's bad for you. You'll get cancer. 
or don't something. Don't do it. <laughs> right? Um, As we're puffing back cigars. But if I, I, but if I know you got a, you got a porn yeah. addiction or that you're, you're yeah. mistreating the girls, that's the real deal. That's I, the real I really issue. do think that's part of the problem. And it's not to say that our health isn't important, that, you know, that there's something to be said about overindulging in certain things that are causing you physical harm. But we do live in a society that's far more concerned with our physical well-being than our souls. And again, I mean, I grew up with that that sitcom Friends. Right. And I often say that if Friends treated fornication with the same disdain it treated smoking with, it would have mm -hmm. been a much healthier show. That's awesome. But it didn't. It right. Was, you know. Can I say something about smoking? Yeah, but come into the microphone more. Can I say something about even, smoking? Yeah, get, yeah just come in. Yeah, just, yeah. I just want people to hear really the beautiful things you're saying. Really comfortable Do you think chair. that's a good chair? Yeah, I really Some like people it. come in, they hate this chair. Well, it's like I like, like <clears> I want to <throat> sit like like this. Yeah, don't do that. Right, <laughs> I uh, won't. I just want to. But uh, I was, uh, I talked to kids a lot about, about vaping. That's a new thing. Yeah. Right. And here's my issue with vaping. Go. It's not cool. It's, it's not cool. Yeah, I, I want to. Here's what I want to. I want to be in charge of the vape, the anti vaping ads, because it's always like, you have any idea how many chemicals you're breathing? They don't care. They don't care. They're 16 years old. Nobody cares. They're gonna live forever, as far as they're concerned. They don't care. Nobody has ever cared. Yeah. No 16 year old I'm has. Gonna live forever. No. <laughs> Can we play that clip? No. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> no 16 year old in the history of the world has ever been like I'm not going to do this because it's unhealthy right yeah. and so so let's do it I want to see your I, your non-anti-vaping ad go alright look into the camera to your left right. too. Your left. to his left alright there you go right there move that into your face is that good alright yeah, look into the camera set, and here is an anti-vaping ad which will absolutely rolling. be a clip go kids of America this is John Henry Spann I want you to, I want to challenge you to do something for future you. I want you to take the vape you have. I want you to throw it in the trash can. And I want you to go to the nearest gas station and buy a pack of Marlboro Reds. Vaping's gay. It makes you look gay. Super gay. And I don't mean gay in the way that I'm attacking people with same-sex attraction. That's a burden. That's a cross to bear. That's not what I mean. I mean gay in the way that when people say people from Phoenix are called Phoenicians. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> so for your own sake, smoke, because it's cool. Don't do either. Don't smoke. But if you're going to, smoke cigarettes. James Dean, the Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, they all smoked and they looked cool. You they got cancer and died, maybe, but they looked okay. You puffing on the little box for <clears throat> hashtag clouds for days, man, <laughs> is so good. And while I'm on it. If you are a white kid who lives in a cul-de-sac and you drive a Honda Accord that your mom got you, nobody's impressed by the rap music. Nobody. <laughs> Be cool, kids of America. Well, on okay. that, we're going to take a break. <laughs> and then if we still have a YouTube channel, we're going to come back. So let's right. do this. Thanks, Neil. <clears throat> okay, it's going okay. <laughs> Thank you.
we're back. And we are back. Awesome. Hey, I want to let people know about Exodus 90. There's this, uh, everyone knows about Exodus 90. It's a 90-day ascetical program for men. Many of you folks are going through it right now. Ends at Easter. But for those of you who didn't jump on the bandwagon back in January, there's something you can do called Exodus Lent. We'll have a link in the description for you to sign up and learn more about it. But basically, if you haven't really decided what you're going to do for Lent, it's really important that you be concrete about this stuff or else, you know, you'll just... I think what a lot of people do is they come up with like 18 things they're going to do for Lent sure. and, they na- and they just gradually get knocked down over the course of Lent and they're not really specific about it. Exodus Lent is really cool. Yeah, you, you've heard about Exodus 90, you're going to give up alcohol, you're going to have cold showers. Not on Exodus Lent. So it's actually a modified version. But don't be fooled, it's still actually quite difficult. Um, there's a lot of prayer involved. Uh, it, it's pretty cool. So if you haven't decided to be awesome this Lent, decide right now. This is just for men, by the way. So if you want, can't do it. So go to Exodus, well, uh, what is it? Exodus 90. Exodus90.com slash Matt. Exodus90.com slash Lent. Link in the description. 90.com slash Lent. Click the link in the description. That way, they know we sent you. They like me more and keep paying me to talk about them. And I'd really appreciate that. How you doing? Awesome. We back? <laughs> yeah, is this back. Yeah. Cool. Did you so, not think we were back? That was, that was pre-recorded, we everybody. We, <laughs> so, you know, we, have, we, have, we uh, didn't just say that. John Henry, you have your students asking about Kit, K-Y-T, saying you promised to give a shout out. Oh, sure. Kit, Kit is a person. Uh... Christoph Quitchen, you're the man, brother. Shout out. So, Did I just say shout out for it to be a shout out? It's basically just all of his students online. We've got like 500 people online, I think. Dude, really? That's all awesome. Students. That's awesome. And then uh, we also had a super chat just to verify that that story wasn't too offensive. I think anybody who's played football, or, I mean soccer, uh, understands right. that. But we have uh, Ricardo uh, Rocha, I think. I just wanted to read it because it's a super chat. Kind of racist but, that you didn't know his last name. Right? <laughs> Don't you think? But he says, as a Latin American, I find the football story totally believable. It sounds like every post-game tussle I've ever witnessed. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, John Henry <laughs> staring down an army of Mexicans. That is my only, the only game of soccer I've ever played through in my entire life. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, because I know that you're really proud about being from Georgia. And I just love when people sure. are proud from being from anywhere. One of the things I've heard you say in the past, which I love, is you like when people sound like they're from somewhere. That's one of the things I loved about Georgia, because I love the Southern kind of American sure. accent. I think it's beautiful. And on women, it's adorable. Right. But, um, yeah, why do you love living in Georgia? Why do you love the South? Well, I'll talk. Yeah, let me talk a little bit about being. Do you want a piece somewhere. of licorice? Not even right. a little bit. No, right. thank you. you. Keep trying to push those on. Uh, <laughs> so, Brilliant. No, I, the idea of being from somewhere, right? I think, once again, it goes back to this culturally sanitized world, right? Where we all live in our cul de sacs that are identical, right? Regardless of whether they're in California or Arizona or New York or Georgia or Florida, right? Yep. It's the exact same thing. And with like suburbanite nothingness, right? It just keeps expanding. Yeah. And people aren't from places. That's why I get so excited. If you've got some nasally accent from wherever, I don't know, where, <laughs> like a Midwest thing, people here sound kind of, there's like a little, you know? Yeah. yeah. Know. Um, or uh, I was at a, a baseball game in Minnesota, New mm-hmm. Ulm. Got a sister-in-law up there. And uh, hearing all the, oh, jeepers, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, my goodness. Don't you know? Oh, yeah, gee. Um, so I love that. I, yeah. think, I think it's so awesome because it says, like, I'm a thing, right? I'm a person with an identity and a background, and that's interesting. And my experience is going to be different than your experience, which is cool. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's neat. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very I'm proud to be from Georgia. Uh, we've been here for a long time. My dad did one of those ancestry things. And, you got to uh, tell the story about Jimmy Carter. In America, because this I love yeah, so this I'm story. Yeah, so not just from Georgia. I want to make that clear, right? Because a lot of people say, "Where are you from?" Atlanta, and what they really mean yeah. is, "Well, I'm a suburb outside of Alpharetta and uh-huh. whatever over here in this really specific place." Uh, I'm from a town called America. Have you heard this about Jimmy Carter, Neil? Is this story? Oh no, no. Just so everybody knows, me, so, John Henry, and Neil used to play D and D together. Mm-hmm. So we true. we go back a ways. Go. Shout out to Jerry Crete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. best DM the... there was. <laughs> uh, so I'm from a rural town in South Georgia, not like super rural. You know, we had like our own high school and stuff, uh, but like 17,000 people, something mm-hmm. like that. And Jimmy Carter's from right up the road in Plains, Georgia, right? So we used to see Jimmy Carter all the time, riding his bicycle around, and you would see Jimmy Carter on a bike, then another guy on a bike behind him, and then a big black Escalator or whatever kidding. SUV driving slowly behind both of them, <laughs> right? And it was one of those places where, kind of like here, that's what I like about being here, is you can walk everywhere. You could, My dad can ride his bike to work. He lives half a mile from, he owns a bar in Americas. Yeah. Uh, he could just zip over to whenever he felt like it. And so you, we knew everybody, right? So I would get on my bike and I would go downtown. And one day I was meeting my girlfriend downtown. I was 14 years old. I'd go to Monroe's Hot Dogs, which is 
a great hot dog place. The hot dogs are like not a color that meat should be. They're this bright red, and then they're white inside. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I never asked. Uh, I don't want to know. But I realize I have this horrible. Right, I, I don't have any money. It's, br- it's brutal. I'm 14 years old. I don't have any cash in my wallet, but I have got to take this pretty girl out to eat hot dogs because I'm a gentleman, <laughs> right? <laughs> we have to go stand in line at the hot dog bar to get this. And so because I'm in this small town, I know Soapy. There was a guy named Soapy who was a barber. He's still there. I have no idea how. <laughs> Soapy was old, old when he's I was up. a very small child. <laughs> and he's been in the same place. You can get your hair cut. You can buy a machete. He's got fruit <laughs> and vegetable stands out front, like Whoa. whole things of sugar cane. It's awesome. Wow. And we've known Soapy forever. So I bust in there. Jimmy Carter is in my way. He's getting his hair cut. Right? And I don't have time for Jimmy Carter because, once again, girl, hot dogs. It's on. Uh, and so I jumped in. All right, I pop in. I say, hey, Jimmy Carter, um, uh, Soapy, uh, can I have five bucks out of the register? I need, and he opened the register. And get, like, it's those kind of experiences. That is amazing. But Jimmy Carter is, uh, we see him around a lot. My, my kid has sat on his lap at Soapy's. I guess wow. he's at Soapy's all the time. Right? <laughs> Just now putting That's that the only together. place I ever He's, meet him. Yeah. And does he have like his security at Soapies as well? There's always a Secret Service guy sitting there. Wow. If you drive out to Plains, he's still got a, I don't know, I'm sure he doesn't work it, but a peanut farm out there, Jimmy Carter does. And there's just nothing, 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 just farm, farm, farm. Then there's like a little telephone booth that's got a Secret Service guy with a gun in it out in front of Jimmy Carter's house. It's yeah, cool. America's interesting for many reasons, but you had a civil war. You know, and we so did. there was this real divide. So to right. talk, I love that you're very passionate about this. Educate oh, this me some, about America. Some controversy. All right, cool, sure. Um, so I'll I'll th- I'll throw it out there. I'll throw out a couple of things first, just mm-hmm. uh, to make sure that I, I check my politically yeah, correct bo- right. boxes. Say what you don't mean before yeah. you say what you do mean. Do you have so, those matches? <laughs> Who's got uh, the right matches? Here, right here. <laughs> Slavery is bad. I know that's controversy. That's a clip right there, Matt. Matt Fred. That's that can be a short, take. Neil. That can yeah. be one of the shorts. <laughs> um, slavery is bad. Slavery is bad. You shouldn't own other human beings, right? Uh, that being said, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Just that, that, <laughs> no, just that is sort of the background information. Okay. A lot of the times when we talk about the Civil War, right? We say the Civil War was fought to preserve slavery. And I want to make a real quick distinction. I'm not some guy who's just going to say no. It's all states' rights. It, it was states' rights. States' rights to do what? Own slaves, right? I agree with that. I totally agree with that. You don't agree with owning slaves. You agree with that's what I it's about. I agree that the Civil War was a war fought over states' rights. The states' right to do what? Own slaves, okay. right? Which is bad. So all that being said, I am still, I don't consider myself a neo-Confederate or anything like that, but I think there's a, I think there's a very real argument to be made for the Civil War. The, the Confederate cause in the Civil War was a justified thing. And the fact that our country being fractured might not have been a bad thing. I don't want that to happen now. I'm not saying, well, <laughs> uh, but I am saying that the uh, that, that I think it's a lot less black and white than we realize. And okay. I don't like Abraham Lincoln. I think he was probably our worst president. Why? Uh, he was a war criminal, mostly, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, things like, uh, things like uh, Indian habeas corpus and the human rights for... Uh, Sort of this martial law, things like throwing the uh, the Maryland state legislature in, in prison at Fort McHenry uh, because they were going to vote to secede from the Union. Now, once again, slavery is bad. However, I don't like living in a world where w- when a sizable piece of the country says, we don't want to be a part of this anymore, the, the federal government can say, oh, but you have to be and we're going to kill you. We're going to send hundreds of thousands of people to die to force you to be a part of something that you are not open to being a part of. And logically, I understand how there's some flaws with that, right? Because eventually, what does that mean? We're all broken up like a Holy Roman Empire kind of thing with dozens and dozens and dozens of these little fiefdoms within some, right? But I still, I still stand by it. I still feel, feel very weird saying, no, if a, if, if a part of your country wants to break away, you should force them at gunpoint. To stay a part of it, and, and that's what happened. Forgive me, I know very yeah, little no, that's about exactly this. So what happened, feel, right? feel free to speak to me like I'm five here. Sure. So, the Confederacy, uh-huh. right? They say we want to leave, right? And they did want to leave because they hated Abraham Lincoln. They were worried he was going to take away the right to own slaves. Slavery was the catalyst. I want to double down, triple down, quadruple down on that, right? Abraham Lincoln says you cannot leave, and if you try to leave, we're going to forced you to stay, right? So it, it starts at Fort Sumter when the Confederates fire on a Union stronghold on an island, right, off the coast of South Carolina. And then it, that's sort of the, that's when the first actual violence takes place. Nobody actually died except for, I think, a mule. 
<laughs> I'm serious. I, there might have been one guy who died when a cannon blew up on him. I'm not a historian. I don't claim to be. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but then we see an incredibly bloody four years of hundreds of thousands of crimes against humanity being uh, being carried out on the people of the South because. Abraham Lincoln and the federal government says, no, you cannot walk away. You're stuck. And you even look like at the at the language shift. Before the Civil War, it was the United States, the United States are, right? The United States are going to war with the uh, with Mexico. After it, it becomes the United States is. And we see the Civil War sort of being this hinge point of uh, concreting together, right, sort of federal power at the expense of the states and the states' rights. We didn't have an income tax before the Civil War, so that's fun. And here's my biggest complaint with Abraham Lincoln, if I can just go off on this, this for a minute. As long as you want. The Emancipation Proclamation, right? What, what is the Emancipation Proclamation? I don't know. Do you know? No. So The idea of freeing slaves? Is that right, right. So typically when you say, what is the Emancipation Proclamation? Um, if you ask a high school kid that, they say, well, that's when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Right. But it's not, right? It's when Abraham Lincoln said, slaves in the Confederacy... Right, that country that is broken away from the United States is not a part of us anymore. They are now free. So it'd be like me saying, um, or Joe Biden saying, Russia is no longer allowed to take this part of the Ukraine, right? And they're saying, like, who are you? Who cares? Yeah, well, you have no, you don't get to make rules over here. Meanwhile, Maryland and Kentucky and even the Confederate held, like Confederate territory held by Union troops that still had slaves were exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation, which means Abraham Lincoln does not free slaves. He could actually free and instead free slaves in this country that is not a part of the United States. Hmm. And from that point on, right, you see a shift in, That's in everything. That's really interesting. I like of, that. Yeah. Of it being now, now it's a war to free slaves, hmm. which it was not before. It was a war to hold the country together. So what's your opinion on the Confederate flag then? Because I think there are some symbols that become so bogged down that there's no use in revivifying them. I hear I that. I think the word gay is like that. Like a word is a symbol. You know, right. the word gay has come to mean something. And as much as I might try to reclaim that word, maybe it's better just to find another word. And I sometimes sure. wonder if that's true about the Confederate flag, Confederate flag, whether it's true or not. In the minds of many people, it comes to mean something synonymous with racism, which is ugly and evil. And therefore, right. let's just find another symbol. But And you're saying um, it's sort of as a uh, like when you'll say people are trying to. Re- reclaim the swastika or something like Perhaps. that. It's, oh, it's a sign of peace uh, and whatever. It's like, yeah, but that's maybe. not what I, I, I see. I, I don't know what people say about the swastika, um, but sure. Like I mean, something I think, that's come to me say, in the minds of many something that it, that it didn't originally. Maybe it's best just to get rid of it. But, but what well, do you think? Well, when you say Confederate flag, right, you're probably talking about the St. Andrew's Cross. Right? Yeah. Red Which is, red I background. have to say, it's probably beautiful. the it most beautiful flag I've ever seen. I can, I can <clears> hear an argument for that, right? What... When I think Confederate flag, though, I think of the stars and bars, which look, by the way, exactly like the flag of the state of Georgia right now. Mm. Exactly like it. Interesting. That was yeah. the first national flag of the Confederacy. The difference is that the Georgia seal is no longer, or was not, mm. right, in the circle of stars there. Um, but that, that's what I think of as a Confederate flag. And I, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure if I'm willing to say, yeah, we just need to throw this out because you're right. The co- Confederate flag has been totally has been co-opted in a yeah. lot of ways by by racists and people who are you know Klansmen and stuff like that. People who are saying, hey, remember that time when we could own black people? Like, yeah, that's <laughs> obviously bad. That's obviously evil. Yeah, right. Um, but I'm I'm not. A, I've got a picture of Stonewall Jackson up in my kid's schoolroom. Right. I think I think there are a lot of stories of bravery and heroism and sort of underdog standing up mm-hmm. for the big guy and protecting gotcha. our people yeah rather than and so i'm not willing to so say we, we, we can be more we, we can be more nuanced kind I of think thing so. it's sort of like you know i mean i'm told that martin luther king jr treated women pretty despicably sure. but okay but he also did great things right. so we don't have to throw him out that's everybody you know? right yeah I mean, the same thing with symbols is what i mean like right. you, you can have a more nuanced look although i but would you fly a confederate flag outside of your house uh i'd fly the the first Sorry. national flag okay yeah yeah yeah. Not the not the not the St. Andrew's Cross. Yeah. Um, once again, because not because I think that it, it would be an evil for me to do that. Yeah. But because I understand the message that I am screaming mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is, I hate black people. That's what people would think when they saw it. Yeah. And I don't want to send that message. Obviously. What's the What's the don't tread on me um, flag? Where does that come from? Let's try to about? make that one racist now. No, I love it. Oh, I, good. I, I, I okay. Want that, I want that hanging up here. No, but, that. But, uh, yeah, the first a, time I ever heard Don't Tread one. On Me was the, from the Metallica Black Album. They have a song called cool. Don't Tread On Me. Right. And the Black Album has that little black snake on the front, and I didn't realize what it was about. No, that was like uh, American Revolution. You know, that was 
like the big finger in the eye of the British, man. I'm all about that. That's a cool one. That's a really cool one. Hmm. I've, have you seen the ones that it's just a cartoon snake, like drawn by a five-year-old that says no step snake? I don't get it, but I know that if I saw that flag outside of somebody's house, there's nothing on earth that would cause me to like ring the doorbell after 6 p.m. It's terrifying to me for some reason. <clears throat> Why? I don't know. I think there's, uh, from, from what I've read online and just sort of the, the kind of people who are saying like, because it's kind of like a meme funny flag. Yeah, yeah. But this, it means something. It means it's like, like, a, it's uh, like a joke, right? There's always something behind the joke. Right, it's like a joke that also implies that I'll, I will shoot I'll you. kill you and your family if you come out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. T- wh- why do you, why do you love, uh, t- t- uh, what do you love about America? I mean, Second Amendment, First Amendment. Well, so we had a discussion a long time ago. The cutter is what I'm after. Thank you. About. Can uh, I see the matches? Mm-hmm. Oh, wouldn't you know what the magic? <laughs> sure, just gives it once he lights. <laughs> Where did you get that? That's a huge cigar. You told me to get one for the That's top. great. I didn't yeah. realize I had that one. Uh, the uh, we had this conversation a long time ago where I said I think America is uh, really broken and screwed up, but it's the best country in the world. And you said why? Why do you think it's the best country in the world? And I stand by that. It's kind of like that old Churchill quote. Do you want me to toss this to you? No, he wants uh, the matches. Oh, on the, the matches. Lighter. Can but I light these right? Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I think First and Second Amendments are really big ones. I think free speech is a thing that doesn't actually exist in most countries, or any country except for the United States, right? Because you have freedom of speech in Canada, yeah, it, but know, then it, there's it, it is, speech laws in Canada. It is funny, because you'll have, like, maybe Canadians and, and others, maybe even Australians, mocking the idea of, oh yeah, we don't have, we're all in shackles over here, you know. But then you see what's taking place in Canada right now, and you're like, ah, I see. I well, see why free speech is important. It's one of the, it's like back in the day, the ACLU. Oh, sorry, Neil. It's out of matches. It's not that I can't throw. It's not that I throw like a girl. It's that there's wind resistance. There's the wind. Yeah. There's physics, totally. Yeah. Um, but there, there really is something. The, the ACLU back in the day used to be awesome, right? They were the guys who were yeah. d- defending uh, Nazis marching in Stoke, Illinois, right? Because they were saying, like, no, they, we hate Nazis. We want nothing to do with them. That being said, this is the United States of America. And you, we can't start limiting. I mean, the slippery slope fallacy, I don't think is a fallacy, right? Once you start to, once hate speech comes up and all mm-hmm. of these things, all of a sudden it becomes anything the government doesn't like is hate speech. And that scares the crap out of me. Yeah. Um, the Canadians are a great example. They've gone off the rails, right? It seems that way. I don't know that much From about it. From my limited perspective, yeah. I haven't been reading too much on it, but <clears throat> I'm a, that, that scares me in a big way. Mm. And I don't think, everybody talks about, well, we're going to have another civil war. And we're gonna have, no, we're not. We're too lazy. Here's what's going to happen. Yeah. We're all going to sit and we're going to stare at our Netflix and we're going to watch our pornography and that while we're masturbating and eating, like maybe at the same time, eating (laughs) cheesy poofs and drinking soda Mm. and being fat and lazy and stupid. It is, it's bread and circuses. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, I think there's a lot of parallels. I teach ancient history, right? We do a lot of Rome and uh, Greece stuff and it really scares me, sort of the decline of civilization, not in a big, glorious, whatever. It's not, that's almost better, Right. I don't want war. I don't like war. I'm not saying like we should have a war, but I'm saying from a from a perspective of like our the dignity of us as a people, if we can even call ourselves a people anymore, mm. right? We, it it is better to be broken by some outside power or something than it is just to not Waste care away. and contracept yourself out of existence and have a nothing culture. That's why when Joe Biden or his Jim Psaki was up there talking about the Ukraine and why are we going, why are we doing all this with the Ukraine or whatever? And she was saying, well, we're here to defend America's values and whatever. And I was thinking, like, what are America's what values? Are our values? Can we stop imposing them on the rest of the world? My values aren't your, when I think about our current American values, and I, I, this really was the first thing that came to mind. Did you see what the protests outside of our embassy in Jamaica about nine months ago, no. six months ago, they were protesting and they were on the news and whatever because there was this big rainbow flag flying outside of the American embassy. That's what we're exporting now. Mm-hmm. That's our colonialism. Abortion, and I'm, not saying, I'm not some anti-colonial, anti-imperialism guy. I'm, I'm a big fan of your Churchills and why I think that makes sense. But yeah, what we're imposing is this nothingness, this nothingness uh, Even values is a sort of vacuous, spineless word. It's virtues and vice and that which we... Okay. I'm dying. You could right. try there. You could try no, that that's one. That's okay. But yeah, that's, that's an important, that is an important point. We say like uh, our American values, and that's supposed to be like a conversation stopper, as if we can't say, what, what is that? W- right. What do you mean by American values? Did you, know, did you see the Tom Hanks uh, voice? <laughs> oh, I heard it was awful. But For uh, Joe Biden? No. So... It was really telling what it said. And once again, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist. I'm really not. In fact, my opinion on conspiracy theorists or conspiracy theories in general is usually everybody's too stupid. Like what's way scarier to me is that like (laughs) 
they're all me. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. all the they're supposed uh, to be like Illuminati black cloaks, like doing all like sacrificing yeah. goats to ball or something. <laughs> yeah. Right? No, they're just me. Just like I don't know. <laughs> send some kind of a check. They'll vote for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's way scarier. Um, but in that ad, Tom Hanks said he doesn't. He skips land of the free. He calls us land of the brave. What is that? Isn't that telling? Yeah. Isn't that something that I... I don't know. That made my, my hackles go up in a big way. Mm. Need a lighter. I know. Actual this lighter. Is, any, uh, any questions or comments you want to read, Neil? Let's see. Someone's saying they're trying to, trying to claim the Gadsden flag is racist. I think it's interesting that I was like looking it up and it's like the Don't Tread on Me snake. And right. The idea is that it's like unified. And I think of it as like a symbol of like anti-federalism, but I guess that was kind of the original like use of the snake was to say, we're like, all in this together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Div divided we like fall. We have to unite right. again. So that's kind of a weird. I don't know. There should be some kind of good because I think that that's the main. At least to my understanding, I wish that it was much. I wish that you could separate those two issues of like if it was just states' rights. Then sure. I think that yeah, like the Confederacy is definitely like, but no. you know it wasn't. But and then, but that is such a huge thing today. Is everyone is, and all the media is all centered around. DC and it's like to some degree it's like who cares like just fix the state first I guess well I think it all I think all of our political everything it comes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning about identity and like to, to answer the question what was the title of this uh, how raising, to raise kids in, in Sodom? Sodom it's worse than Sodom but how it, to, uh, it is it is um, but mm. I think the, the answer to that question really is like you have to give you have to let your, your kids need to know who they are they need to know who they are I once I had no idea who I was my wife's the same way. My wife has said going to high school, she felt like she was being thrown to the lions, really? right? And, it's, and that breaks my heart mm. for her and for me. And for, I will sit at prom or homecoming or something. Uh, I said this to an open house recently. I'm sitting there and I'm watching, uh, I'm, I'm watching the kids dance and they're dancing to like 80s stuff. And I actually know most of the words and they're not dancing in a way they wouldn't if their grandmother was there, yeah. you know? And I'm, I'm sad. I know that sounds weird. Like I'm sad. It's almost like an envy sort of thing because yeah. I'm thinking, you know, I know, I know these kids for the most part and they're not perfect, right? It's not all rainbows and unicorn farts or anything. We have problems, but I know what they're doing after the dance. I know where they're going. Oh, the boys are going over to so-and-so's and the 10th grade boys are going here and the, these girls from this group are going away. And I know like, I know what their, their, their intentions are. I know that they're struggling to be like, they're struggling like in a good way, right? They're struggling for their own souls and their own salvation. And I think about what I did after prom. Yeah. And what I did after homecoming. Yeah. And when I said I was going to spend the night over at so-and-so's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now my, I think that often about my kids are so much better than me. Like my 14-year-old son is such a better person than I was when I was 14. Well, yeah, my, my wife and I have these conversations on a fairly regular basis about how I, I have, I struggle a lot with sort of that anger and resentment and frustration um, from <clears throat> things that were totally outside of my parents or her parents' control, you know? Um, that I, I think God lets me struggle and fight, wrestle with that because it keeps this fire burning in my belly and it makes me super comfortable for me to pull kids and say, you know, have these conversations. And I mean, the kind of things that I'll, I'll, I'll say to a group of guys that, uh, you know, hanging out at school or whatever, are things that no person ever said to me until I went to college and then they were, they were peers. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would love to. I'm not. I, it would take me a while to pull it up, but part of my assignments every week for theology of the body and for my ancient history class, I always have things that are not, have, are in no way related to the text, right? Things like uh, um, call your parents on Wednesday. That's a home day uh, when they're out of the house, and just tell them you love them and don't explain why, right? Or send an email to somebody and tell them that you appreciate them. Or t I think one of them this week was look at yourself in the mirror for five minutes. No music, no nothing. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself. Am I the person that I want to be when I fulfill my vocation? And then, if not, why? This is a, a, an exercise that I, that I really like with kids where you say, and if any of my students are listening, they've heard this a hundred times, but I challenge the girls to think about the woman that is going to be walking down. Think about them when they're walking down the aisle in a white dress, right, with a veil over their face. Mm. And the boys to think about them standing at that altar watching this woman who wants to love and honor him all the days of her life and give him children and care for him while he cares for her, all these things. And think about that person right now and live to be that person, right? 
think about the things you want them to have done and the things you want them not to have done. And we, we almost feel like, and I think I struggle with this more than a lot of people do, but we, we feel like we're, we're young and all the important stuff and the serious stuff is so far away. Mm. And it's not, man. It's really not. I mean, I still have so many wounds and frustrations and resentments um, that I deal with, that my wife deals with, that we that are from thinking we're kids. Kids yeah. do dumb stuff. This is what kids do. And they don't. I talked. Uh, we were talking the other day about the, the idea of, uh, of community and a bubble. Mm-hmm. Right? And how we're supposed to live, especially as young people, but always. Right? And you'll, you'll hear people say almost pejoratively, right? We're in the Bosco bubble at my school. Yeah, right? Steubenville bubble. Steubenville bubble, right? As if, like, you know, we're just in, like, a bubble. This is, it's just, like, a weird little thing. You know, it's just, like, mm-hmm. there's the real world, and then there's our bubble, right? And what they don't realize, I think, when they talk about that negatively, is what they're calling a bubble is what we've called for the past 12,000 years of human civilization communities. And they're good, and they're natural, and they're normal. Right? We're supposed to live with similar people, with similar views, with similar ideas, where we love and support and take care of each other. Mm. Right? And God willing, you're going to leave here, and you're going to go out into the real world, you know, whatever that's supposed to be, and you're going to end up fulfilling your vocation, and then either coming back to this bubble, or into a new bubble, or starting your own bubble, because bubbles are communities, and communities are good. Mm. What do you think is the right thing in that, though? When people say you're in a bubble, I think there's some sense in which what they're saying makes sense, isn't there? You're probably right, but I just I, I don't know what, but I don't know, what, but, I, but I haven't thought thought about it because I, I like your point. It's good. Like we should live with like-minded people who we love and care for. I think after the industrial revolution, right? We all got th- this idea of the city, the big city. That's why I said that a hundred times. Like last yeah. night we were sitting there with that we with the guy with the long <laughs> hair who was just swearing left yeah. and right yeah. and just being gross while there was a drunk girl on the floor eating popcorn. Yeah, we were right? in a weird pub last night. Yeah, yeah. we were in a weird pub. And we'll go, the city! And right, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of mocking this idea of like, this is real. This is this what, we, is what yeah. we're supposed to do. And no one ever thought that way. I mean, until, until what, 150 years ago, 200 years ago? The Industrial Revolution changes and we all move out of our... Their, cities always existed, uh-huh. but <clears throat> not on the scale that they do now, right? And so... 90% of people lived in a rural setting or whatever it was, 80%, and then 20% lived in these cities. But now it's like the real world is the city. The real world is this place where there's all these tons of things to do, and you can be independent, and you can be self-made, and you can do all of this. Like, no, you can't. No, you're not. Nobody's self-made, really. Mm. I, know, I, I, I believe that, right? Mm-hmm. You need like-minded people. And that's why, once again, with raising kids, your kids, and I, I want to say this really loud and clear and make sure that parents understand it, your kids are going to be the sum total of the five people that they spend the most time around, mm-hmm. right? Which is why I love the hybrid homeschool thing, because two of those people should be your parents. Mm-hmm. Also, if you think your child is going to be the light to the world in the public school, I had a mom say that with a straight face to me in an interview a while back. She said, well, our oldest, she's at so-and-so, and um, it's not really, it doesn't really agree with us and our everything, but she's going to be like the light of Jesus. No, she's not. No, she's not. She'll be trampled. Right. She's yeah. going to be, if she's lucky, she's going to keep her head down and be a social pariah and survive on the other side without her dignity and worth torn apart. Right? But probably what she's going to do is say, I want love and I want affection and I want attention. And I'm willing to sacrifice all of that stuff to feel like, and my parents who I see for an hour in the nighttime when they get back from work, maybe they make us eat dinner together. And, but I'm staring at my stupid phone all the time. And then I'm at school with all these other kids and I've got my whole life is centered around people who are totally contrary to everything we're doing. Your little, your daughter's not going to be a light to the world. That's you're throwing her to lions, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Um, if she survives, you're making her life a whole lot more difficult afterwards. Go back to what you said earlier when you said love your kids enough to make them hate you because I don't think we ever kind of really sure. explored that. No, I, I think kids need parents. Kids don't need old friends who gave birth to them, right, <laughs> who, who, who care for them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not enough to, like, once again, loving your kid is a big deal. Letting them know they're loved is a big deal. But... Uh, I use the analogy, right? I have a daughter, Mora. Mora is, uh, I love her desperately. She's your goddaughter. I love her. Um, she is the By the way, let's point out the gift I got for Mora on, on her baptism. You remember? It's a bottle of vodka. bottle of vodka yeah, for you. She loved it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was great. Um, she's the meanest person I've ever met. Uh, she is. Like, I, once again, I love her desperately. I do anything for that, do- for that girl. Yeah. Um, but she, she'll do things like, uh, like I heard a noise down the hall. About a year ago, and I went down the hall to see what it was, like a splashing noise. And I turn a corner, and she's in the bathroom with a glass. She's filling up the toilet and <laughs> dumping it on the floor. And I look at her, and she looks at me, 
you know, she's like naked, big belly, just <laughs> never breaks eye contact. <laughs> It's ridiculous, uh, and she'll she'll steal food from her siblings and feed it to the dogs. <laughs> like for her, she'll run into the kitchen, you know, oh, little it. chubby whatever down the hall <laughs> to the dogs. Um, but anyway, uh, Mora goes when we go to the beach. Right, this is the analogy I'm getting back to. Uh, we're sitting at the beach, and I'm sitting down drinking beer under my you know umbrella or whatever, and she'll just run into the waves, sprint full out into the waves, <laughs> boom, <laughs> boom, 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 back. Yeah, stand up. Run into the waves, yeah. right? Kids do stupid things, right? Kids eat sand, kids do whatever. And so what I do, so my daughter doesn't die, is I pick her up and I say, you cannot do that because you're going to die because that's bad for you because I know more. And it's really easy when we do it then. But once again, it's easy to do with physical stuff when they're young. Why aren't we brave enough to do it with more abstract things when we get older, right? If you love your kid, which you all do, anybody listening to this who has children, I'm sure they love their children, but... <laughs> You have to love them enough to make them miserable sometimes. Mm -hmm. You have to love them enough to say, no, I'm sorry. I know everybody in the world has Snapchat, and you pinky promise that you're going to be great on Snapchat and whatever, but you're not going to get Snapchat because it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. And I know it's bad for you because I'm older, and I'm also not your friend. I say that to my kids all the time. I say that to the kids at school. I love you. I want what's best for you, and I have no intention of being your friend until you graduate. Mm -hmm. They're very dear to me. I love these kids, but mm -hmm. they don't need friends. Right? They've got lots of friends their own age. They definitely don't need friends who are parents. I think part of it is, you know, we said earlier about we're going to do things that unintentionally hurt our children, maybe because they subjectively interpreted what we said mm -hmm. wrong. And that makes us afraid, sure. right, as parents, because we don't want to do that. We don't want to sure. hurt our kids. Sure. Um, and so we, we therefore want them to like us, mm -hmm. do you see? No, that, totally. That's where it comes from, I think. Yeah. And once again, I, I'm still at a stage in my life where my kids, I'm Superman. You know, yeah. Like my oldest is nine, Henry. I love him to death. He's me. Like he looks exactly like me. You can vouch for this. Um, I got Mary Margaret and Teresa and Mora, and I'm the best thing in the world, no matter what I do. Right? Mm -hmm. I haven't gone through the teenage years, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of kids. I talk to a lot of kids who have and who are right now mm -hmm. in that in that stage, and a lot of kids who are past it. And I'll say to parents on a regular basis, "Let me thank you now for your child when they're 30." And they're going to be really difficult and scream their heads off and yeah. be really frustrated. Yeah, yeah. But they're really going to appreciate it. Well, um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, gosh, I've totally lost my train of thought. Kids, children, son, daughter. Well, oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, you can try to I've totally forgotten. That's fine. I just, I just <laughs> he doesn't need a match. He just needs the cardboard. He's like MacGyver. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, when I speak to parents, uh, I haven't done that in quite a while directly because of the COVID and because of how this YouTube channel has exploded. Um, but it's just to say, like, look, your life could be easier than it is right now. It doesn't have to be as complicated as that. Right. Because you could send your kid to a public school mm -hmm. or to a crappy Catholic school. Mm -hmm. But now what's going to happen is you're going to be sending them into a grade and all of their peers are going to have phones mm -hmm. and Snapchat. And now you're going to have to either give them a phone or let them be a sort of social leper outcast, right. which is going to be difficult for them and it's going to be difficult for you. Or you're going to give them a phone and then you're going to have to spend a ton of time deciding what apps work and how they could get around it if they... Right. Whereas what you could do, and here's, here's only one option, nobody has to hate us for saying this, is you could homeschool your children mm -hmm. or you could send them to a very good... And just, again, I think like if you took all the Catholic schools in America, I think less than 1% I would consider as very good. 100%. Yep. Right, Absolutely. you could send them to one of those schools and then <clears throat> life could be a lot easier for you. Like sure. it doesn't actually have to be as exhausting sure. as regulating their phone and not have them look at you in the face because they're addicted. Like, so what I, I'm actually inviting people to is a more, it's a, it's a more restful life. And If you don't want to lose your child though, if you want to be able to have a conversation around your Thanksgiving table when your child is 30 years old and then to have some semblance of the same culture and the same beliefs and the same morals as you have, I will say I, it is possible, but barely if you send them to 90%, 95% of the schools out there, private I, I and I think it was true when we were kids, too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, and there's something to be said for people are saying, you know, we need to, we got to revive these schools. we got to save these schools. Yeah. Great. Get a job there. Or what? You no. Know, Anthony Esselon or, says... Or give it two months. Anthony Esselon <laughs> says, you don't send your... When you want to convert the cannibals, you send missionaries. You don't send your children. Yeah. 
adults can go in and do that. That's not your problem, and it's yeah, definitely it's not, not your, your child's, child's job to be light and salt. You're, I, I remember being a kid, and my my mom, I love my mom to death, right? And she was, there was this kid who had a, he was, he was, he was weird. Maybe there was a, so, some sort of a mental issue or something, I'm not 100% sure. But a lot of kids picked on him, right? And she told me, given, you know, her, her advice that was coming from a really good place, she said, John Henry, you're the kind of boy who, if you're just nice to him and ask him to play, other kids are going to say, yeah, come on. Like, we're all going to do that. We're going to rally around. You be a leader. And I remember thinking, I was like seven years old, thinking, mm. that is a great way to get my teeth kicked in. That is a great way to get made fun of. That is a great way for me to get put. So mm. I'm going to not be mean to this kid, but I'm going to ignore him because I just need to survive. Mm. Right? I need to keep my head down and keep <clears> moving forward so that I survive this situation. Yeah, yeah, I would also recommend like to people listening, especially if you're kind of about to get married or you're about to have kids or if you have young kids, especially in this post-COVID era where people are a lot more working remotely. Like, we have a lot more freedom than we may have had mm -hmm. five years ago to take yourself out of that cul-de-sac and come to Subinville or come to Ave Maria in Florida or go to some town where you actually are going to have the support of good Catholic community. Because what ends up happening, what I've seen in my own family, and, and we're, we're not perfect, I'm not a perfect parent, I'm a bad parent sometimes, you know, our kids have issues, I have issues. So again, just to kind of reiterate, this is not a holier than thou thing. I mean, I'm here precisely because I'm not holy enough, right. and I need to be, and I want my kids to be, is that, is that your kids end up getting really cool formation in ways that like you don't even intend. So my son Liam, because he's cool plays D and D with his friends, two cool. doors down that at the cool. Welker's house, right? Yep. They did an eight hour campaign yeah. the other night. That's awesome. But I, I, I walked in on them once, right? And they were about to play D and D and Deacon Mike Welker, whose house is like, all right, boys, let's just uh, pray a divine mercy chaplet before, we, before you guys begin. And I couldn't believe it. They all went, oh yep, yeah, okay. And they all jumped up. We all walked into the living room and prayed the divine mercy chaplet. Right. It's, so it's not, it's not all on my shoulders to help them. My, my kids are rubbing shoulders with friends who go to mass every week and and who are going to confession mm -hmm. regularly. So it's it's a lot easier. It well, doesn't and, have to be as and hard. That, that's what it is too, because what's more impactful on your son is not the deacon walking in and saying, let's pray. It's all the other boys saying, exactly. yep, let's do it. A hundred percent. And I think I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but what I love about our situation and our school is not we've got good Orthodox teachers. Like that's great. That's necessary. I love that. Right. But there's a positive peer pressure and a real pushing of all the other kids. It's totally the inverse of everywhere else, mm -hmm. right? Um, or not of everywhere else, but everywhere else that I've worked, where they they care about each other. They have each other's backs. We had a group of our juniors and seniors do Exodus mm. um, last year, I believe, and they asked me to sit to give a talk. I went up and I gave it just like a purity talk to them. And I said, like, "Can I just hang out? Can I just sit down?" Yeah. And they're having conversations that I didn't have until I was in my late twenties mm. with the other guys. Like, "Hey, I heard your dad was." struggling with this or that or the other how's that going i'm praying for him I'm praying for you or last week you said you were struggling with porn how's that going like i'm you said you were gonna call me if you felt tempted like what's going on you never called me i mean really digging is a it's a pretty typical thing i'll tell you this we do a group of men at our school so shout out to all the group of men leaders there and here's what it is once a month we get together at somebody's house it's three or four hours long the first hour and a half or so full contact football they go down on the field, they just beat the crap out of each other. It's, these are I, teenage boys. These are that teenage boys. I don't do anything. I just hang out. I don't lead it. I'm just there yeah. to hang out. Right? And they're just, you know, car accidents happening on the field. Just boom, boom, boom. It's manly. It's strong. It's tough. It's good. Even the kids who don't want to necessarily get out there and play football, there's this real positive, like, no, come on. You're on my team. Let's go. Let's rock and roll. They'll get out there. They beat the snot out of each other. Then we go and we eat. It's just gluttonous, ridiculous, beautiful mothers who make us this awesome there's like 50 guys there right mm -hmm. eat and eat and eat and eat and then for the last hour hour and a half the senior boys or the junior boy whoever's in charge that day reads the gospel reflection for sunday twice like alexio divina thing right they read it quiet for about a minute read it again and then they talk about it and the conversations last hours they go down all these rabbit holes people are sharing all these things it is it's weird, and I say weird as in like good. Weird as in uncommon, mm -hmm. right? Common, what our common culture right now is not normal, right? It's common but not normal. We are normal even though we are uncommon, right? And it blows my mind. So all that, all that is to say, it's not so much us. Like us, we're great. This is great, but it's that community. You have to do it in community. Yeah, you have to do it with other people. 
Yeah, yeah. Gosh, yeah, I couldn't encourage parents enough to, like, if you're not in a good Catholic community, get up and leave. Because I, I tend to think that, like, seeing a family in secular pagan society at the end of a cul-de-sac, 15 minutes away, drive from their mm -hmm. closest friends and whatever, it, that's like encountering a child in the woods. It's like, you, you don't belong okay. here. Right. And if you don't find help, you will die. Right. That's what parents are like, I think, in modern pagan society, unless they you know, band together. And it's not about um, distancing ourselves from the world. You take here in Steubenville. I mean, this podcast reaches more people than, uh, who knows, you know, that, that, that I would have ever thought possible. And the people who have their individual apostolates here are traveling around the country. They're doing work at the, we have a food kind of bank up the road mm -hmm. where homeless people come and prostitutes come and sit down and chat. And like, Great. people are yeah. engaging in the world. It's right. not like we're trying to wall ourselves off from it, but you need to be surrounded by other people who can help you. Well, I have a tendency too to, sort of be Amish, you know, like close the gates and just hide behind the compound or whatever, you know? Yeah. And that's disordered, right? You shouldn't do that. Like, I, I truly believe that the... I'm open to the argument increasingly, right? but yes, I agree with no, you. I, I believe that the secret to happiness is land, lots of babies, lots <laughs> of guns, right? I think those three things, like if you're a single land, guy listening, here's what you need to do. If your vocation is to marriage, you need to marry some girl, have a ton of children, buy all the guns, just... All of them. What you think I said was a lot of guns. <laughs> what I said was all of them. And get some land, right? But we can't totally isolate ourselves. I was saying this to somebody the other day, right? Like, if Angie, my wife, my beautiful bride, heart of my heart, right? She's lovely. Um, desperately in love with. Um, if she died tomorrow, my inclination is, I'm going to go live in a cabin by myself and mm -hmm. totally isolate myself from the outside world. And that sounds great because I'd be mourning and whatever and i get that. But logically speaking, what would happen? I would end up falling into all sorts of sin and drinking myself to death and, mm -hmm. and whatever because we're not supposed to do that. And mm -hmm. that's just a biological thing, right? Humans are social animals. We live in packs. We have forever. We just call those packs tribes. Mm. And we or need bubbles. those tribes. <laughs> or bubbles. Yeah. Mm. Um, before we wrap up, I need you to tell us a story about the time you went to Mexico and nearly got killed. Okay. But is there more you want to talk about before we begin to wrap up? Because I don't want to cut your time short. I don't know. Bless, bless your kids at night before you put them to bed. How do you do that? What do you do? What do I do? Mm. Uh, I don't know if I should be lecturing anybody on how to do this, but I, I, I said what I, I think I said this earlier, right? For It's a little different for girls and boys, right? But in terms of not just telling them you love them, but showing them you love them and going through this, right? I sat down with them at night. I had an awesome man who raised 12 kids, I think, who I pulled up uh, at a, just a pig, pig roast or something. And I mm. said, why are your kids awesome? I'm jealous, and I don't. I'm not as good of a man as you are. Please tell me how I can help my kids. And he said, "Bless your kids mm. every single night." And so I get down with them individually. Right, there are four kids. We're living in a two-bedroom house right now while we're building on this new property. Um, and I sit down with them every night individually, regardless of what's going on. It's got like it's like five minutes, three minutes each. Right, they make a sign of the cross on their forehead. I do the God love you, Mary, or God hold you, Mary keep you all the days of your life. And then I just remind them of everything that I want to say to them. Right? I'll do this with high schoolers too sometimes, right? They'll ask me to do it. I'll say, You need a blessing. Come here. Right? And it's, it's things like you're a, if it's a guy, right? You're a prince of heaven. You're a warrior for God. You're strong. You're stronger than you realize. And I'm proud of you. And I see you, right? I see you as a man. Like you want to be a man. It's in there. You got to fight for it, but you are. Uh, and if it's their older kids, will be like, It's an ontological fact. You're a man, <clears throat> right? Even if you don't want to accept that and you're going to be miserable, but you just give them that long winded reminder. Here's what I love about you. And here's what's true. Even if you don't believe that this is true, this is true. You are good. Like you are good. Not like you behave well, like you are good. And if God were to strip everything else away, right? All your achievements in life, right? They're all gone and all the bad stuff you've ever done, right? I like to have a spiritual director who's talked to me about this. And really, if we take that, we strip away all of our, all the good, all the bad. We just look at us. Like, how do you not like it? You know what I mean? How do you mm. not like it? You're good. You're this thing. You're this, yeah. this beautiful creation, right? Who sucks sometimes? <laughs> like I do. And you achieve and you fail and whatever. Who cares? You are good. Anyway, that's what I do. That's beautiful. Kids, that's, for, that's really great. Yeah. yeah. And it's hard. And it's obnoxious. I don't want to go watch YouTube instead of yeah. you know, blessing them at night. But. And I would also say, because I experience it myself, is is an awkward conversation or choosing an awkward moment is sometimes way better than not doing it because someone will say that right like, well that'd be a, bit, a little bit awkward it will right. be, be awkward i'll talk about kids about porn but that's a bit awkward awkward's the new black just press in i like that yeah 
I like that. Better better to have an awkward conversation. It is so it's so worth it, I think. Yeah. And the dads and I mean the moms too, but it does become it does become more of the dad's problem as the kid gets older. That's what I see. I'm very seldom to have high schoolers say anything about mom. I know that's mean, but like that's kind of mom's job. Mom's there. Mom's mm. a rock. Mom loves you. Mom's got your back. Yeah. Mom is, yeah. is whatever. It's usually dad. Those wounds are usually from dad once we're after puberty, mm-hmm. right? That's who we're looking to, even if we don't realize it, right? Even if I'm a super cocky boy who doesn't think, you know, I'm not paying attention to my, you are looking and longing for your father. Mm. And you are looking at him for, for advice and for what it means to be a man. And a lot of times, unfortunately, as you get older, you'll see, well, this is how I, I don't want to be a man. That might be your situation with your dad, but we are all looking for that. You know, I was talking to my friend Bob Schutz the other day, and I was talking about the fact that, yeah, I, I know that I've wounded my kids from some mm-hmm. legitimately evil things that I've, I've done, you know, yelled at them for no reason sure. or got angry or whatever. Um, and like, wh- I, sometimes I can feel crippling. And I say this to those out there who've got older kids and they're like, gosh, well, little, little, little too late now to hear right. this advice. And he said to me, yeah, but like if your dad came to you and he said, you know what, I'm, I'm so sorry that I did this and that and, and that I never did this enough with you. Mm-hmm. I want you to know that I love you. And he said, wouldn't, wouldn't that just make up for everything immediately? I'm like, yeah, it kind of would. That's awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's And so it's like you're only one sort of apology mm-hmm. or one decision away from reunion because that's what sin does. Sin breaks union, but you can, you can reunite through apologizing and, and loving your children now. And the only thing that's standing in our way is the awkwardness. Right? And, and a lot the, of it comes out of the awkwardness. It's our pride, yeah. Pride, dude. Yeah. Pride's like my thing. Yeah. Like I'm, a, I'm really proud of how prideful I am. No, but I, I really, like, that's my big sin, dude. I, so it gets difficult, way. too, as your kids get older and decide they're infallible. Sure. Uh, and then you think, well, I can't apologize because if I apologize, I concede the point and make it more about what I did wrong than what mm-hmm. they're continually doing wrong, which they can't see. But there is something really beautiful. It's like if I want my kids to know how to apologize... Right. It, it, it comes a long way coming from dad. He's like, you know what? I, I, I was wrong to do that. I'm going to go to confession for that. Please mm-hmm. forgive me. And not just say, it's okay. I mean, I've done that to my daughter once. I, that's right. I got, I got frustrated with my daughter the other night. She, she's so beautiful. But I, I, I kind of got impatient with her. Mm-hmm. And it, it, she, she was crying. And uh, I said, I'm so sorry I did that. Like, I'm going to confession. I love you. You're my favorite person in the world. What was her reaction? <laughs> well, oh, I mean, she was beautiful. Well, what she said was, it's okay. And I went, no, it's not. It's not okay. That's, That's why I'm apologizing. So please forgive me. I, c- could you please forgive me? So I, could you say it? You know, I think that language is important. Yeah, I, and it, it does come back to pride, right? I, I, I'm very good at apologizing to the people in my life right now. Like my wife, I'm apologizing to her all the time, right? <laughs> but not, once again, not in like a dopey sitcom dad kind of way. No. But, you know, we, we suck a lot of times, right? We do, yeah. we do things we shouldn't do. And so I'm apologizing to her. What I struggle with is those people who you're not, that close with, who you owe apologies to, right? And it's one thing to say, you know, people talk about sitting in front of a mirror or whatever and saying, you know, I apologize to so-and-so or I forgive whatever. I've started writing letters to girls that I've just misused in the past, right? Who yeah. I didn't, I didn't treat with the, the dignity. When you were a teenager, whatever. just for those yeah. at home. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. When I was a teenager, yeah. before I was married. Um, and uh, I don't, this might be selfish to say, but like, Right, even though I will, I don't think I'll ever get a response ever, and that's okay. I'm not owed a response. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Amen. Something about doing that. I did the same thing. Cool. Yeah. N- How no, did it go? Did you get a response? Um, I actually, I remember I actually wrote a letter to one girlfriend that I fornicated with and mm-hmm. was trashy with, and as a teenager, and I, I don't know if I got. A, I think she actually didn't understand it. Almost like there's nothing. Why would you apologize for being trashy? Isn't trashy normal? Like she, that was really sad. But I also wrote letters to people I bullied as as a kid. Like there was That's those cool. kids at school who everybody picked on. Right. And looking back, you're like, well, if, you know, like they they acted weirdly, but everyone was so mean to them all the time. And I jumped on the bandwagon. So I I wrote two letters to to two people who everybody picked on in my high school, and one it was an email actually, and and some I don't know how I got their email, but they they wrote back and and thanked me. And said it was really tough. Like, yeah, you were awful to me, and people, good. and I hated That's that. That's great. But what was uh, what? That's that, a good response. I, no, it is a good response. Post it's okay. But, but what right? was sad was some the other person. It was a boy, a guy. He wrote back and was like, "It's totally fine, man. No, it's fine." And I'm like, ah, but it, it really, really, really isn't. But but no, I, I agree with you. That's something we could do. We could make amends by writing a letter to those people that we've hurt and say, "I was trashy, and I'm sorry for being trashy." I I firmly believe. And this is going back to, to girls because once again I've got all these daughters and I think about this stuff a lot. You you just talked about your girlfriend, previous girlfriend, who was yeah. saying like it's okay. Yeah. You know, why are you apologizing? 
I think deep down, and ladies can correct me if I'm wrong here, but from the time they're, you know, six until the time they're 122 or whatever the oldest person in the world is, right? I think that at the end of the day, girls just want to, like, be... They're, they're still seven years old in a princess dress, one day to say I love you, you know? Because <laughs> I'm still that way in some ways, right? Yeah, Where yeah. I, I just want to be respected, right? I just want, like, me... Two-year-old two me on the ground pretending like I was a police officer or a general or something. Like, oh, I just need you to be like, yeah, you're, 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 you're good enough, right? I respect you, and I think that you're good, right? Yeah. And I think with girls, because I think we want respect more. Yeah. And girls want love. Mm -hmm. And when, we're, when we do a pornography unit or something in my Theology of the Body class, we're talking about porn or prostitution or sex trafficking or whatever. I think that's a good reminder is like, at the end of the day, this is just some girl who wants, wants to be told that she's good. Mm -hmm. And she's okay, and she's worth something. Yeah, I don't know. That hurts me. Yeah, Did I tell you about the time I gave a talk in um, Baltimore, and uh, a prostitute stood up. <laughs> After talk? Yeah. Cool. No. Yeah, I was in the Basilica at Baltimore giving a talk on pornography, and at the end, people raised their hands and asked questions, and someone stood up, and she was a, according to her, porn performer, prostitute, sex worker, all this stuff, and. And she told me all the reasons, she was about to tell me all the reasons I was wrong, which I was cool with. Sure. And, but what was funny is as she began, a guy in front of her stood up and shouted at her because he was hor horrified that someone would interrupt this talk at a church with her filth. So I then shouted at him. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. I said, get out of here and let her speak. And so he left. <laughs> He literally left. What did she have to say? But what go? was cool is she started to speak, and I said, I'm so sorry that happened. You probably didn't want to be yelled at today. Please, feel free to speak. I'll let you go as long as you want. Mm -hmm. And she went, and she said all the things. And her thing was basically, you're making these porn performers and sex workers out to be victims. It's not true. Like, I'm happy, yada, 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 yada. And then I started to respond to her, and she interrupted me. And I'm like, no, no, no. You've had your say. Let me have my say, and I promise you, you can have the final word. Right. Okay. And my basic response to her was, you're wrong to be happy. Right. You think you're, you're happy, but you're wrong to be. I mean, we've all encountered friends who they've been in like messed up relationships. And girls sometimes do this, right? I, I've had girls, well, say to me, you know, they'll have a girlfriend who's dating a guy who's tr clearly bad for her, but she doesn't see it. And they're like, dude, you less just don't say, dude, you less yourself when you're around sure. him. And she'll be like, but I'm in love. I'm happy. You're wrong to be. Right. So that's kind of was my point. But then I did, I let her have the final word. Because I hate when people say, I'll let you have the final word, but then they don't. Mm -hmm. So she went off for about five minutes. None of what she said refuted anything I had to say, I thought. And then we closed in prayer. It was beautiful. And what was cool is that guy <laughs> I shouted at <laughs> came up and apologized to the porn performer. Oh, that is cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, and he came up to me and apologized to me. I was like, oh, I you forgive were gonna you. say he's now a prostitute. He's now a prostitute. Full circle. circle really, life. yeah. She's and, in combat. And, and she he's a yells at him, <laughs> and it's a weird situation. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. That is beautiful. Yeah, that's. I wonder if that's probably one of the strangest things that's ever happened in my ministry. That and going to the Middle East and meeting people from Saudi Arabia. That was really cool. But it's fun, man. What a beautiful life. It's cool. So, it was really cool. When we were talking about this the other day, or in, our, in the car when we were driving. We were talking about your ministry and my ministry, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm small I potatoes, was so, I was right? so blessed by what you said. I, I, the only reason I'm here is because I've been doing a long con to get on this show since 2012, and I met you outside of St. Luke's yeah. or whatever, and it's finally paying off, right? No, but... Um, <laughs> finally. But, After all those fake conversations. And, <laughs> I just had to play D&D. Yeah, I, I had to play D&D like with you. Are you kidding yeah, me? No. Is my mic still working? I just kicked the cord pretty yeah, that's hard. Yeah, that's just the cover. Uh, but the idea of on the battlefield, right, your ministry... That covers all. It hits all these people. Could, could we so begin good. by why you said that? Because I, I, I have I, no I'm idea. Be so blessed by this. Because I'm going to take this out as a clip and play it to myself repeatedly. Because I was so moved by what you said the other day in the car. And it's like I've said to you. Like I often don't feel like convicted that this is what the Lord's calling me to do. Sure. I don't have that conviction that I encounter in other people and would die for. Right. I see these people. Like, this is what the Lord's called me here to do. This is what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I legitimately want that. Right. But so often I'm like, I, I pray to God that this is doing some good. I often don't feel like it is and ask the Lord to make up for the many, 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 many ways that I and my guests lack, you know? But sure, sure. The analogy I like, right, is there's this battlefield, right? We're fighting the demons and we're fighting for these souls or whatever. And your ministry and similar ministries, right? They mm. do, you give the you give the big talks or, you know, Chris Stefanik goes up and gives a big talk at the Catholic Youth Conference or whatever and Steubenville, Atlanta and all these things, right? Those are car carpet bombers, man. You're B-52 just flying over. It's awesome. Mm. Right. 
But that doesn't do everything, right? That doesn't that doesn't take everything out. Then you have the guys on the ground who are sniper rifles sitting in a pillbox somewhere, poop, 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 going to individuals. So this message, right? Whatever you're doing, whatever awesome thing you're putting out, it's going to everybody. It's going to thousands and thousands of people. It's going around the world, mm-hmm. right? You got books out there. You got all this stuff, right? And that's that's good, but you need that in addition to that individual guerrilla warfare. Like I know you, you individual. You're I'm yeah. looking in your eyes and I'm going to talk to you as a person, yeah. right? And it's a both and situation because it would not if it if it were all me there'd be like seven people right who end up converting mm. maybe hopefully God you know God willing right with you it would be all these people who might not ever who need that extra push and that extra step led. and that personal, yeah, personal whatever yeah. right and you would miss all of those people so it's a both and yeah and. You know, by the time we die, I'm sure we'll retake the Holy Land and conquer the world. And, yeah, it'll be great. <laughs> no, that's that's so helpful. I heard somebody say what people often need is not a sage from the stage, but a guide by their side. It's nothing like that. I think you need both. You need both. I, I like that. Both. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's really good. Can we end by you telling us that story about how you went to Mexico? Or is that, has, an, is that a super inappropriate story? I forget. No, it's not super inappropriate. It has nothing to do with anything. We don't have to say great. it. Great. Uh, no, no, no. I'm saying it has nothing have to do with... Have you heard the story, Neil? I have not. Well, no. buckle up, everybody. It has nothing also, to do with Also, we should like say right now, if people have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat right now. And after we get through this incredible story... <laughs> It's not that great of a story. You're building it up too much. It's this okay. terrible story. Yeah. Yeah. The story sucks, guys. All right. All right. So this is, uh, it was not in Mexico. This is in El Paso. Is that the one you're talking about? I don't know. Didn't you go to Juarez? Where'd you go? Okay. I know the story. Yeah. All right. So I was at my buddy's bachelor party. My buddy, Jordan, who's a roommate of mine in college. He's a good friend, right? And it was, with, it was me. It was John Power, the guy that I've talked about a couple of times. Um, and Jordan and my buddy, Kyle, and... Jose Luis, who was Jordan's friend, who was driving us around. He had this cool car, right? And we leave the rehearsal dinner, and there's me wearing khakis and a peach-colored polo, <laughs> right? I look like I'm just like white, middle class. I'm all the things that I've been ranting against up here, right? And we're driving back to the hotel. It's like 9 o'clock, y'all. It's like 9 o'clock at night. It's early. I'm in freaking El Paso with my buddies. I got my passport in my bag. Like, I was ready. To, these were like my college friends. I'm expecting we're going to throw down somewhere, right? There's going to be a party, right? And they're kind of like, ah, I just want to go back. I just want to go back home. John Power was kind of on board with doing something fun. Kyle, um, great guy, a little shorter than I am, kind of fratty looking a little bit then, a lot of flat brim hat kind of deal. <laughs> he totally was just ready to go home or whatever. And uh, I say... I say, let's go, to, let's go to Juarez. Juarez is right there. I can see Juarez, right? It's like the most dangerous city in North America. You know, it's all these gang warfare and cartel, everything, right? And uh, they said, no, we're not going to Juarez. I do, we got to go to Juarez. But what about Juarez? What about Juarez? And so finally they said, all right, we'll go to a bar. We're not going to Juarez. I said, all right, Jose Luis, because he was from there. So I want to go to like the most like Mexican-y Mexican bar here. I mean, like Rose's Cantina from the song, like, I'm picturing dirt floors and sombreros, like a rooster on a bar stool. That's what I'm after. <laughs> He's like, okay, all right, I got you, I got you. So we go to this bar. We drive like 30 minutes and go to this bar. I walk into this place, dead. Dead as a doornail. Nobody's there. Industrial piping kind of thing. There's like lasers kind of just, mm, 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 mm. but it's just depressing, sad, empty. So we get a table, and I'm really frustrated. And Jose Luis is like, just got to wait, 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, this place is hopping by 11. It's like 9.45, 10 o'clock. We order some drinks. I'm so, I don't even buy alcohol there, right? I got a flask in my boot, so I just get like some Coke and, you know. Yeah. And um, 10.15, 10.30, 10.45 goes around, comes around, and there's nothing. It's awful. I'm ready to go home. And he's like, dude, 11, wait. And he said, if we're lucky, there's this guy who comes in here sometimes. And his name, and he said, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe the name. And I'm like, okay, what's the name? He's like, I'll believe you. No, you're not going to believe it. I'm like, come on. He goes, his name is El Diablo. <laughs> I was like, no, there's not an El Diablo. I was like, dude, I'm serious. He's an enforcer for the whatever cartel, and this is his spot. Like, he comes here all the time. We should see him like, okay, whatever, right? I'm miserable. I'm mad at him. I'm mad at Jose Luis. I feel like I've been bait and switch, whatever. Freaking 1059. Rolls over to 11. It's like they opened a gate for like everybody comes in. 
This huh. place is it's like the size of a basketball gym, right? It's full of people. And all of a sudden, those ladies are going, everybody. There's a live band gets up. It's wild, right? And they're singing in Spanish and whatever. It's super cool. I'm really digging it. So now we're ordering drinks. We're having a, a great time. We, uh, Kyle was kind of uncomfortable with being there, right? He was just like, I really want to go home or whatever. And we said, no, dude, we're, we're hanging out. John Power's a big guy. I'm not a small guy, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're like, we're gonna go get you up on go up in the front. He's like, please don't. Like, get no, you come what? on. We're gonna get you up to the front, up okay. to the stage, yeah, right? Yeah. So we grab Kyle and we got him. He's like, guys, stop. We're like, yeah, we're gonna have him like, it's Kyle's birthday. It's Kyle's birthday to the band. And the band, there's all this. It wasn't like, his birthday. No, I don't no, know what his not. birthday was, but it definitely wasn't. I was like, Feliz cumpleaños, Kyle. So everybody, man, it's killer. It yeah. is so much fun. Yeah. And I mean, like. A little dark, like there were totally girls behind us, like doing coke <laughs> off their pinky nails. Uh, like it was, is crazy. Yeah. And so, eleven thirty, eleven forty-five. This sounds so made up. It's not made up. You can get John Power on the phone right now. I'll tell you the same story. Right. The doors open. The double doors open, and people just sort of step back, like the entrance to the bar. Right. People kind of step back, and this real tiny little Miami Vice looking guy comes <laughs> in, big lapels. Unbutton down here to show like three little squiggles of chest hair, big gold <laughs> chain, and beside him is this monster of a guy, just this huge dude, like six four, Nicholas Wonder, just walking in beside him. And Jose Luis is like, "Hey, it's El Diablo." I'm like that's not El Diablo. It's El Diablo. Don't call him El Diablo. Call him this, and I won't say the name, just so I don't get like killed, killed in my sleep yeah. tonight. Yeah, and uh, and. We've had a few drinks. We're having a good time. And so he gets close and we're like, hey, so and so. Oh. We'll call him, what's his name? We'll call him Johnny. Johnny! <laughs> He's like, like, come on, we want to buy you a drink. We want to oh. buy you a drink. He like walks over and he's kind of whispering to the big guy and he says something. Big guy or he or the big guy say something to Jose Luis like, "Why do they want to buy me a drink?" And they're like, "They just think you're cool. They just wanted to talk." Because Jose Luis is not okay with the fact that we're inviting this guy over to our table. <laughs> and like once again, it's just constant. Oops, 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 oops. So yeah. we're like doing shots with El Diablo, right? All this stuff is going on, and another fifteen minutes go by. He's kind of dancing a little bit, and then he says he's going outside for a cigarette. I'm like. I want a cigarette. And to paint the picture, once again, I'm wearing a peach polo. <laughs> I have, like, pleated pants on, right? And, like, loafers. So, I'm like, I'd like to go outside, too. I, too, I too enjoy nicotine. Huh? Yeah. Um, so, we go outside, and I think, it, I mean, to make it more better, I'm pretty sure I bummed a cigarette off of El Diablo, <laughs> right? So, um, I'm sitting outside, and I'm smoking with El Diablo. Sorry, that was not for a fact. I just want to smoke my yeah. cigar a little bit. And uh, we're talking about everything. And... I, so for some reason, I said, after this, we're going into Juarez. We've been talking about that all night. We're going to go down to Juarez and whatever, whatever. And I've never, I'm not, I'm not really like super easily intimidated by people. You know, I've always kind of been a pretty confident guy. Yeah. This tiny little man <laughs> reaches over and grabs my chin. No. And turns it to him. <laughs> and he says, you don't want to go to Juarez tonight. And I didn't right then. I've never been so in the moment. I was like, it was bone chilling. Sort of like, okay. And Jose Luis, I still don't know why, is like, hey, we really need to leave. Right now, we need to leave. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, no. And we talk about once again, I don't know what it means. I don't have any context, but it was bizarre. And that's that the time that my life was threatened by a fabulous story. Mexican drunk cartel guy. Man, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that. Any questions, Neil? Oh, no, we're pretty good. Um,. We're pretty good. There, there's one or two. One was asking earlier in the show, you were talking about um, kind of having people in your life who you considered as like your first friends mm -hmm. because they were, uh, you know, not afraid to call you out on things, I guess. Uh, and someone was asking how to kind of, uh, I, I guess, be that for other people. What do you think that that looks like, the way to think about that um, is? Because, you know, a lot of the time I think people think they're doing that and they're kind of just like... Well, it's tough because... they're. And I, I want to make a. I want to draw a distinction between. It's not just calling people out on stuff, right? I mean, a lot of times people boil it down to that. Like, I need to be kind of a turd to my friends sometimes when they're doing things, like that, which is definitely a part of it, right? But I think. I think it's simpler than that. I think it's loving others, right? It's it's loving your friends for their own sake, right? Willing their good for their own sake, which is just the definition of love. And when you do that, and you build that relationship, saying, "Hey, man, you said." You're saying this, and I see you at church, and I see you doing this, but then all of a sudden, 
you know, you're you're lying to this girl about that, or you're you're saying this to our guy friends, and you're not treat you, the language you're using and the things you're doing aren't, aren't great. Like, I'll give an example. We we when we get together, sometimes you know, bad words come out of our mouths, right? Yeah, it's just easier when you're hanging out with friends, and all of a sudden you're saying things that you wouldn't say if your wife were right there. And then today, what you did in the car when you said you said some you had some curse words slip and you, and you crossed yourself, and I was like, why, why are we crossing ourselves? And you're like, well, I'm I'm trying not to curse and whatever. And I was like. Oh, that's cool. Okay, I should do that too. I think it's being that loving example and not making it just about judging you. Because yeah. we always feel judged. I'm super quick to feel like I'm being judged. But mm. I didn't feel like I was judged when you were like, oh, I'm, I'm just trying not to curse and it's probably yeah, not something yeah. we ought to be doing. I was like, oh, that's a good point. Mm. I'm going to try not to curse too. No, so, that, that's cool. And even this morning, you know, I texted you and I said, uh, I'm going to that hipster coffee shop. Because we were staying at an Airbnb last night, which is awful. It was mm. Awful Airbnb. Oh, bad. And uh, you texted back and said you were going to go try and find Holy Mass. Right. But, like, that's another example. Like, it's like you're just, this is what you're doing. You're not, like, judging me for me not, me going to a hipster coffee shop where you're going to Holy Mass. Right. But it's like, oh, that's cool. That's what you're doing. It's like, it's like good peer pressure. Yeah. No, it's I like, like hey, that. let's do this. That's positive, yeah. positive peer pressure. Yeah. It seems cliche, but I think it's, it's real. And, but that, that only comes once you respect someone and you I, know that you are loved by that person. Uh, one thing I've heard too is that you ought to take a holistic interest in people's lives. So if you've got a kid and they're off the rails because they're doing drugs, they're doing porn or something, if you make your entire relationship about educating them as to why they ought not to do that right. thing, it's like, yeah, but that. what do they love? What are they afraid of? What Netflix shows are they watching? What are they doing next summer? What are their hopes right. for the next five years? Like, I need to, if you're interested in, in me as a person, then I'm interested in your thoughts on why I should be maps doing this or not doing that. Yeah, but. and if you're like me and you're, you're incredibly self-centered and selfish, right, which I am, you know? There is almost a fake it till you make it kind of thing. I mean, I've gotten so much better over the years, uh, like in caring about and investing in somebody else's life mm. by consciously saying, you don't need to talk only about yourself. Ask them a question. Mm. Ask them a question. And, I, and once you do that and you start a dialogue, it's good, but it almost feels fake when you start. But I think mm. you have to make an actual like effort to, to, to foster that and for that to grow. Mm. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. Um, I mean, this is kind of a a weird uh well not weird but um i don't know if it fits the only other question was from someone who were saying let me just read the comment just to get some thoughts and some Bef before you get to that i want to let people know that lent is coming up on wednesday and for those who are watching right now i compiled uh, i didn't compile I, I thomas aquinas wrote a book to prepare people for lent it's daily meditations throughout lent I, to my knowledge i don't know of a publisher who publishes the book so it's in the public domain, so I created a beautiful PDF. And I'm going to put the link in the description uh, so that you can kind of get that. It's free, and uh, you could read it throughout Lent. It's, again, it's not something that I, I didn't go into his works and take out things having to do with Lent and made it 40 days. It's something Aquinas wrote. It's 100% free. I'll put a link in the description for the PDF. You can download it. And, and uh, over on Locals, I think it's, what is it, locals.com slash Matt Fred? I don't know. Neil, what is it? Oh, well, you can go to uh, pantswithaquinas.com slash support. But overall, so Locals is free. You, you can watch all of my morning podcasts, but we're going to be basically doing these morning meditations. It's called Morning Coffee. It's another podcast I have. It's over on Locals. There'll be a link in the description. You can click that, go over there. Um, yeah, so if you want to do that, that's free. That'll be cool. Any other questions or should we wrap up? Um, so this one's from No Face. I'm a schizophrenic 21-year-old man. Any advice for a young man whose mind is not fully present at all times and who can't hold down a job because of illness? I'm Catholic as well. Oof. So just, just bless I you. Guess, some, yeah, I love you. My, I mean, I know that sounds trite, but it's true. Like, oh, man. That's tough. That's a cross for sure. And I don't even know. I don't know exactly what all that entails. Well, my I mean, my I'm, first thought would be like to seek out professional help. You know. Um, so I'm thinking of Jerry Crete, who we've had on the show before, who's a psychologist who both John Henry and I know. Souls and Hearts, is that the name of his yeah, podcast? I know they have a website as well that you can contact Jerry through, and he might be able to put you in touch with a good Catholic therapist in your area, or at least point you to a place that would be more helpful than whatever I'd say. Well, and to expand on that, and it doesn't really fit my brand, you know, I go outside, and I build things, and I kill stuff, and whatever. Dude, therapy is the best. Therapy is mm. so good and it's so necessary. I go to spiritual direction and I pretend like it's not therapy. It 100% is. <laughs> I'm always recommending people to. to yeah. I'm not saying this fellow is not doing it. I'm not talking about him in, in specific, but just in general. Yeah. Right. We need that. It's so good mm. to just have a non partial person to sit down and talk through problems with. It's it's beautiful. So if you're a particularly young man who's feeling like I don't need to go to therapy. You do. It's fine. Like I, you, I remember once feeling bad about I started going to therapy. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe it's kind of like 
I don't know, a little soft or something. And I said to my friend Ryan Foley, I'm like, hey, this is crap. This is ridiculous. I mean, like John Paul II's mom didn't go to therapy. And I don't sure. know why I use her as an example. But he's like, okay, well, maybe she would have been a lot happier if she did. I'm like, all right. That's awesome. I guess that's a good point. So I teach John Foley's daughter. Right now, oh, she's a nice uh, in my uh, class. Ryan Foley. Ryan Foley. Yeah, sorry, yeah, Ryan yeah. Foley. Molly. My God, Molly's gosh. My Get to know him. Get to know Ryan Foley. Awesome. Your life will change. Don't tell him I said that. Oh, if he well. asks, I hate him. Deal. But between yeah. you and me, I love him. All right. I think that'll do. All right. God bless you, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. Click you subscribe. Click that bell button. It'll make me feel good. And make sure you follow me on nothing. I don't have anything to promote That's at all. That's so cool. I love you guys. And our website's terrible from Bosco. But <laughs> so don't go there either. Yeah. But I, I love all of you. Thank you. Thanks, John. This has been great.